So we're streaming now. Okay. Oh. Uh, hey, that's on. how they that's how they programmed the voice for Qbert. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. We've got chatters are in there already. There we go. Just making sure I shut off the sound when it came up. I was waiting. Yeah. That delay. I've had that problem. Yeah. Joe Drosen, S1500, Chris, Brad, Chris, two Chris's. Hey, guys. Good to see you in the chat already. You guys all warmed up already? You don't need us? So that's cool. Okay. <laughs> what would we do to warm them up, though? I don't really, <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Well, hey. we, we warm them up every week with what we've been working on. Oh. I thought you meant like... I mean, the first 45 know. minutes of the show are a warm-up. Oh, I thought I was thinking like, you know, make them jog in place. And then yeah. Touch their feet. I mean, right, right now, I, I Warren is like having hot conversations with people. <clears throat> I'm chatting. Chatting it up. <laughs> I've got my uh, mock tail going here. Okay. I've got my ter terrible... I found one um, from Canada, Canada. Is it actually terrible? <laughs> it's French. It's terrible. What, what, what are you having, Warren? That looked like a. It's a forty ounce. A lovely tumbler. It, I wish this was filled with a a Moscow Mule, but it is. Oh. Just... <laughs> That's what this is. This is uh, ginger ale, uh, well, ginger beer and lime juice and a bit of uh, just. Seltzer water because I I didn't want any alcohol tonight for so, but yeah I love Moscow mules in the summer they're so good oh yeah they are tasty mm hmm or a mint julep would be nice mm. I like those it's a gentleman's drink <laughs> what are you drinking yes. Brian I just have water you're I'm not on easy. Oh, you can't have anything because you just got your belly button operated on. Yeah, I got it's more like torn open, but we won't go into that. Oh, um, my gosh. Yeah. Um, umbilical, what is it? Hernia. Hernia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have something I feel like like it's right there. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to leave it. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> the whole timing thing was kind of funny because the like it happened last Saturday. I was oh. putting in a dishwasher. I went into work on Sunday. The head of surgery walked in. I was like, hey, what do you do with umbilical hernias? He's like, well, it depends on how bad they are. How bad? How big is it? I'm like, well, here you go. <laughs> you just handed him your hernia? Well, I just was like, why don't you feel it? So he's sitting there <laughs> poking my belly, you know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, um, <laughs> if I didn't I mean, you feel my hernia? That's like a phrase That's I never want to hear from anybody. <laughs> doctors say that all so, the time. We do it in the lounge, you know. So basically, it's a two week recovery. I'm on call in two weeks. And then it's six weeks till you can really like get back to everything. And I moved to Colorado in six weeks. So I'm like, well, it's either we fix this now or who the heck knows when I'm going to do it. So it was bam, done. Let's go. Wow. That's funny. So what's the one that they poke you in the nuts for then? That's not, I mean, that's, that's an ing inguinal hernia. Okay. And that's when you oh. turn, turn your head and cough. Mm hmm. No. Yeah. yeah. So they don't keep that yeah, one in mind. And I can tell you, after having learned that exam in medical school, <laughs> I have never had that exam properly done to me. Because oh. what they do in the doctor's office is not what they, I mean, I'm not even going to get into what they show you in medical. They're like, you got to do it like this. I'm like, no, that was never done to me. That was <laughs> oh, never done to me. <laughs> there's, uh, well, let me tell you. You better buy me cupping, dinner first. Cupping. No, right. there is no cupping. Not at all? <laughs> no. That's what? the funny thing. That's what I, Yeah. I think I've been abused. <laughs> no, I it, the cupping is what happens to most people. I can tell you how you do it properly if you want to know. Why not? It's, we're warming up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to show anybody, but basically you invert the scrotum with your finger and you slide your finger up into the inguinal canal so that your finger is about this deep into the belly. Right. Oh, my God. There is no cupping. <laughs> I've never had that done. I'm like... They're like, and you go like this. I was like, whoa, that's not normal. Well, here's the funny thing. I've never had a cup either, so someone must like you. 
<laughs> was, I like Billy Seven's response. <laughs> it was a female doctor, so I, I wasn't upset. But <laughs> you're getting some compliments on that shirt tonight, Mark. Oh, hey the, guys, the cup of Thanks. noodles. Got it from Target. It's pretty great. All right. Well, you know, <clears throat> I didn't prepare anything really fun uh, for this whole mess. Oh. I did update my computer, so I'm expecting things to go completely horribly wrong. Oh. That I, uh, well, it's been a couple seasons. Yeah. It's been <laughs> a rocky third season where the beginning of the third know. season, right? Yeah, we didn't really know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we added video, really, was it? Let's see how this goes. Okay. Live Finger from table. KOYR Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Arcade Radio. Hello, Commander. Computer reporting. Intruder alert, intruder alert. What was so funny? Hello and thanks for listening in on the Arcadosphere. This is season four, episode 27 of the Arcade Radio Podcast. Today is Thursday, July 2nd, 2020, and the time is approximately 7.23 p.m. Central. I'm your host, Adam Sofa King. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined by my co-host, Mark Time Runner Shields, and part of Paradise Arcade Shop Proprietor, and Park Ranger, Brian Thurston Hall Armitage III, and joining us tonight, arcade game inventor, audio video engineer, American actor, fledgling improv comic. He's done it all, folks. Please, a round of applause for Mr. Warren Davis. I thought so anyway. How come I'm the only one clapping? You guys have to clap. You give a round of applause. All right. I'm trying to pair with a light bulb. <laughs> Uh, since you're since you're pairing with a light bulb, then let's Brian. What have you been working on? Ah, uh, let's see. I'm not moving too much uh, heavy stuff this week, so I've been doing a lot of scanning. scanning. Uh, I got the War of Worlds side art scanned in, Dogfight uh, glass scanned in, and Speed Freak scanned in. So mostly just doing some computer work and getting Excellent. some artwork done. Those, for all those people with War of the Worlds out there. Somebody turn on a fan. What the heck just happened? Um, am I back on? Yes, you are back. Oh, good. Because my computer literally, I don't know what I did or what I touched, but it totally wigged out. I've never seen this before. Uh, I had a blue screen that I literally have never seen before. And uh, yeah, I had a <laughs> abort and restart. <laughs> well, I'm oh, glad you're God. back. I didn't even notice you were gone, but I'm, you must have froze good. on the that's, screen. That's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got the show I notes was, open. I can't see anything. That's what I was anything. talking about during the intro. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I was kind of chuckling. I'll wander off. Adam's going, "What's funny?" I'm like, and, and we'll see funny. if anybody notices. I just got a message from. <laughs> I just got a message on Facebook from Warren. It says, "I don't know what happened, but my PC just wigged out." So, okay, as you can as you can see, I'm totally self absorbed, and I don't really, you know, I don't need anybody but me. So anyway, uh, welcome back, Warren, and we just had a great intro for you. Um, and, and Brian was telling us that he was scanning all this artwork, so that's really cool. Uh, Mark, what have you been working on? Uh, so I've been digging through my treasures, Ooh, and treasures. I've found a few things that I thought were interesting. I got my uh, Maniac game. Maniac? What's... Oh. oh. It, so I think that these people wanted to have a, comp a competing game to Simon, hence the four players. Sure. But really, this is... This is four switches and then a very simple uh, LED and uh, and a beep a beeping thing. It just beeps and there's four different games and 
it's, it's I guess it wasn't as popular as I don't uh, know why other well the name sounds like you're gonna get killed or I think <laughs> <You're> right <laughs> is it made by Tommy who made it that's a good question T- uh ideal ideal oh yeah yeah they're I mean, like that a, hey that's like a mass produced game right it looks like yes. it's made it looks like a prototype yeah it does look it does I mean you know I guess what year is it nine nineteen seventy nine yeah. So a little a little antiquated. That's really awesome. I have a whole bunch of those old games. Does it? So wait, was this Simon predates that? I, I think I feel like they came out roughly around the same time because the, oh. uh, mm. you know, well, found Atari, a lot of. Go ahead. Atari had a game too. Did it? The Atari Touch Me. Did it really? Yeah, the four. <laughs> the, it was a four button Simon game, and then oh. they they also had a a home version of it. Huh. Uh, Ralph Bear was responsible for Simon, though, wasn't he? I think he was. Yeah. That sounds familiar, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, you know, red, blue, yellow, green panels. Looked like a UFO from Close Encounters. How, who would not want that in their house? I mean, I have one in the box behind wow. me. We'll have to show it to, to us next show or something. Sure. And the other thing I got, uh, I, I found my ColecoVision... Uh, Atari adapter, cool. Which which is fun, but I don't know where the ColecoVision is, so that's kind of a bummer. If you need a ColecoVision, I can send you one. What? Yeah, I have like three of them. Nice. You can have one. Okay, well we'll talk. Okay, I'll I'll send you something fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, some like box rocks. That'd be good. Uh, so is that what, is that what you've been mainly working on? Yeah, I haven't really had time for games. Um, I mean, I got some relays for the environmental discs of Tron. Yep. Uh, so that was fun, but it didn't fix my uh, light blinking issues. Mm. I have everything working, just lights. You know, I don't know why I'm like, I can't button this up until all the, the fancy light flashing is, is working. I feel the same way, though. I mean, if there's a feature that's supposed to be working, well, what am I saying? I had APB for... Seven years before I got those stupid triax fixed, and it was like a, you know, I just all I had to do is order the parts. I just never did it. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I know what you. I know what it feels like though. It's kind of. What are you working on? Oh, uh, ma- mainly organizing parts. So you know all those little tubes of ICs that you get, and you buy over the years, uh, whether it be CPUs or RAM or whatever, seventy four LS, blah blah blah. Bang. I had just stacks and stacks of these things that I've never organized. And over the last week during meetings and stuff and after work, I've been uh, tediously organizing every single IC and component in my collection so that I can easily work on stuff and find the stupid parts that I need when I'm working on games. And it turns out that I have uh, an adequate number of 6502s, uh, 6808s, 6802s, and, a, and an obscene number of 6809s. Uh, so if anybody wow. needs a 6809 processor, do not buy one. Just let me send you one. It's, that, that's one of the funniest things that we have a problem with here in the shop, too. It's like we'll buy stuff. It yeah. goes in a box, goes on a shelf, and then we can't find it. Yeah. We we need it. We order it again. Yep. And then... That's me. All right. Now we've got a hundred of these chips. It also turns out I have a fair number of pokey chips, which uh, is quite handy. So, uh, original so or those new cool FPGA pokies? I have two uh, FPGA pokies, but I have a, uh, about a dozen regular pokies, AMI oh. branded, and they're new old stock, so they've never been used. So I, I actually I bought them probably ten years ago, and I oh, just man. I just found them. So uh, this has been kind of fun. I've been finding all these parts, and and then like, it's astounding to me how much I remember about the various parts and why I ordered them. Right? Um, you know, I, I can look at a uh, certain audio amp and know that I bought that for Centipede. You know, um, or you know, it, it's just weird. Like, why would I know that? Um, and then and now I have like. A hundred of them, or something. That you're a parts savant, I think. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. and it's like a game of memory for me because I, I'm not really good at organizing everything exactly the way it's supposed to be. So, 
I try to group things by type. So if there's 74 LS chips, RAM chips, that sort of thing, you know. Do you, do you know offhand uh, what type of RAM chip goes into the uh, Terminator 2 arcade board? I don't. Uh, is it an 81256? I, I don't know. I'm asking because I, I, I don't know, and I, I, I'm afraid to go pull my machine out and open up the back because hmm. there's a lot of junk around it. Yeah, I... But, um... Uh, that's my my problem is that my my terminator 2 uh fails on one chip fails the ram test when it powers up i can i have a board sitting about 20 yards that way i can check later we do have a bunch of arcade guys on our chat so we'll see if somebody is able to uh solve that in the next uh 15 seconds cool by the way so i i had the chat up and i was able to read it but then my computer totally wigged out, so uh, I'm not I'm not touching it. I'm not I'm that's right. not bringing it back up. I can't Safer. see the chat. We will relay <laughs> chat messages that are directed at you. <laughs> Thank you. That'll make it easier. No, one you. of the What's interesting though is this is something we were talking about just before the show, is um, you can have and usually it's not just a single RAM, but you can have RAM errors when the GPAL chips start to go on the terminators. And so that's actually one of the problems that we're having with one of ours, uh, because there is a there's a GPAL problem and it's taking out a lot of the video RAM. Mm, interesting. Okay. Now well, here's a, I looked up in the manual what the RAM is and it it has the the midway part number. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I hate that. What's the point of that? Uh, it does. What? There's a 4464D RAM that's used. Um, but yeah, like some of these descriptions are so, like the video RAM. It says midway part number, and then the designator, and then video RAM control. Thanks, thanks for that. Oh, that's for the control. I don't know. Yeah, I I really gotta extract it from all the stuff surrounding it and just open up the back. Mm -hmm. That's that'll be my project one day. Yeah, there's uh, 8K times 8 SRAM midway part number. This is useless. Don't look at the manual because you can't even call <laughs> midway now. You probably know that. <laughs> I don't think anybody really expected that this would be a problem, uh, you know, 40, 35, 40 years in the future. Probably not. What? <clears throat> That is that is one of the funny things. I mean, we play these games and we all love taking care of them. We forget these are 30, 40, 50 years old in some cases. I mean, I was chatting with a guy today about a monitor and he said, well, shouldn't I just convert to a new flat screen? I'm like, what LCD flat screen do you have in your house that's more than 10 years old? <laughs> right. He said, no, I don't have one. I said, so we should probably fix the original CRT. If we get it going well, it'll last a while. Right. It'll be good. Probably thirty or forty years. Although I yeah. have seen I have seen uh, conversions of old uh, arcade games to use flat screens, and I, I got to be honest, I, I'm not a purist. I, I think they look pretty damn good. Sure. It's the to me, it's kind of funny because you with I mean we do a lot of the repairs here. You end up spending a little bit more most of the time, and then this is the thing is I haven't seen an LCD from China that lasts more than five to ten years. Mm -hmm. So you know you're going to have to redo it, whereas the CRTs, when we fix them well, I mean, if you do them right, they should last 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. If the guns are good in the tube, you know, but if, yeah, so it's interesting. But <laughs> And Brian Jones said he's scratching you off his uh, Christmas card list now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because of the flat screen comment? No, Come on. Now, now, wait, you, have, you do have to understand that Brian Jones, his favorite game is Exterminator. So, I mean, he is a diehard exterminator. Uh, he is absolutely passionate about like it's. He has uh, like 10 games, I think, in his game room, and one of them is exterminator. He has oh, a very I... eclectic collection. I thought you were going to say he has 10 games and nine of them are exterminator. Yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. <laughs> oh, by the way, the answer is 4464 DRAM. 4464 DRAM. Okay. That's what, that's what okay. you're. In, in a U66 to U69 per the manual. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Excellent. Glad we could help. Do you guys have any of those lying around? <laughs> Actually, I do have four, oh. 4464s. Yep. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll talk later. All right. All right. 
Let's make a deal. I know that because I just organized the damn things. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, so what what have you been working on, Mark? Uh, Mark, Mark. What have you been working on, guest of the show, Warren? Uh, well, these days I, I uh, sort of split my time between uh, uh, still doing some software uh, programming stuff for uh, Sony, doing some game related uh, software for Sony uh, that is also retro related, uh, you know, uh, involving uh, some of their older titles. And um, but you can't talk. You can't. Sorry, what? You can't talk about the titles. No, not really. Dang not it. Really. Can't really say too much. But uh, us is for us versus them too. That, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Literally, no one has ever suggested that. So. All right. <laughs> I know. I. Uh, yes. You, you, you came up with an original there. Yes. Um, Go. But then you know, I also do. Uh, um, I'm involved in the theater. I've been involved in theater for as long as I've been doing video games, actually, and. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of, up until the the coronavirus, there was a lot of vibrant uh, theater going on in Los Angeles, and uh, I, I had a, a good time doing a variety of things: I, actor, director, uh, also sound designer, uh, which is sort of a thing I just sort of fell into and uh, realized I sound design dozens of shows at this point, won a couple of awards. <laughs> nice. uh, it's uh, you know not something I was expecting to do but it's, it's tons of fun uh so yeah I, I keep myself occupied uh pretty much the way i always have which is i like to do things that uh i enjoy that are fun yeah sounds a lot more fun okay so that's great um maybe after the show i talk to you a little bit about um audition processes and such i actually for a while i've been thinking about doing community theater because i used to i mentioned before the show that my first paying job was an i was an actor Mm -hmm. um and and i you know i got that the theater bug when i was in community theater as a teenager and uh and i thought i was thought was something i wanted to do and i was going to apply to tish uh university and be a drama major and then i realized that people don't make money as actors (laughs) <laughs> and so i kind but of you said it was your first paying job right, right? so uh, 70 dollars yeah. a week i was gonna get rich well, you got a taste of that sugar baby <laughs> <laughs> yeah what's as you said any paying job is a good job right that's right yeah for as an actor anyway there's anything that puts your next meal on your plate and allows you to crash on someone's floor until the next gig <laughs> something like that anyway i apparently i just decided that that wasn't for me mm-hmm. it's uh, honestly it's it's not for a lot of people i i had a friend uh very good friend of mine um out in uh, chicago because i came out to los angeles from chicago and uh, uh i was I, as you know making video games in chicago but i was also acting and um when the arcade industry dried up is, is when I kind of saw the writing on the wall and I said, well, you know, I, I had resisted moving to Los Angeles, like for my entire life. <laughs> uh, but then I started to consider it because there was both video game development, mostly on the home game side, but there was video game development and acting in Los Angeles. So uh, I did come out here and I came out here for an exploratory trip and I came out with a friend who was an, an actress friend and she uh she got a leading role in an independent film and you'd think, holy moly, that's fantastic. Right. Well, Mm -hmm. she hated it. She absolutely hated it because she was used to doing theater and commercials and theater, you know, as obviously you're working pretty hard, you're going through the entire play commercials used to be very fast. You'd show up on set for a day. You'd crank out this commercial. You'd be busy all day, but on a movie set, she found she was sitting around doing absolutely nothing for 90% of the time and she hated it. Mm. So she quit acting. She quit yeah. acting for a while. She was a, a, a radio uh, talk show host, which is something she loved and, uh, and a uh, writer became a writer. So yeah, but it's just, it is really interesting. A lot of people want to be actors. I don't think they really understand what being an actor means. Yeah. I don't want to be a, a an actor or anything that my life is going to depend on my skill. I just want to do it for fun. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. I, I mean, that's, again, I, I, I started doing it for fun and uh, I still do it for fun. Um, you know, I make a little bit of money at it, but certainly not, not enough to live off of. And, and uh, 
the pressure of having to make your money off of acting is 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 a really difficult pressure. And I've, I've certainly come to uh, both respect uh, and admire actors who dedicate their lives to that craft. It's a, uh, it's a tough life. Yeah. It's a very tough life. Can be a tough life sure. for most people. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's going to lead us into our very next segment, which we, we like to, you know, jump right into heavy stuff like the news. Stevens. That's sort of my name, but we'll just uh, we'll go with it for this this round. What do you think? Did you like Did you like your name in the intro this time? Uh, yeah, uh, very clever. <laughs> as long as the next one isn't uh, last name Hunt, first name beginning with M. No, uh, oh. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of reading library books in junior high, and seeing who checked them out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There was always some sh- guy pulling shenanigans with clever names in the checkout cards. I th- I don't know. Do you guys remember that? Uh, anyway. Maybe it's because I worked in the library for a while that I knew that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's news. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so from The Verge. Uh, an AI discovered an extremely weird way to beat Qbert, apparently. Ooh. So... This goes back a couple of years, but you'd uh, you'd think computers would naturally be pretty good at video games. They run the things, after all, so they know all the rules. But it turns out teaching a machine to play games designed for humans is pretty complicated. And when you do, strange things can happen, even in a game as simple as (laughs) Qbert. The Verge reports uh, on a team of researchers at the University of Freiburg in Germany who had been teaching... AIs to play 1980s Atari games. They're studying uh, a kind of AI that uses what's called evolutionary algorithms uh, as a form of machine learning and testing the results by having algorithms attempt to play through uh, simple video games. Versions of the algorithm uh, that do this uh, are well kept, while others are discarded, uh, with tweaks made to the remaining to see uh, what they can improve their skills with. So one of these routines discovered an exploit in the emulated version of Qbert it was playing. And here's what the researchers wrote in their papers on the study. First, it completes the first level and then starts to jump from platform to platform in what seems to be a random manner. For a reason unknown to us, the game does not advance to the second round, but the platforms start to blink and the agent uh, quickly gains a huge amount of points. So... Uh, close to a one million for uh, the the episode time limit. So when when Qbert designer Warren Davis saw it on Twitter, uh, he said it doesn't look like something possible in the original arcade version of the game. It's likely a quirk specific to either the emulator or the port. Uh, did you ever find out Warren if, if if it was possible to do that exploit on a regular version of the game? No, but I'm pretty sure you can't. It's they were using the Atari port, and uh, oh. you know it's completely different code. And believe me, you know that was one of the worst ports anyway. Because yeah, yeah. you know, it, yeah, it just looked terrible. And who know? I don't know. I mean, I have sympathy for whoever had to code it, but I don't know what kind of tricks they had to pull to even get it to do what it did. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a completely different set of code. I, I didn't write a, a line of code for the version they used. Yeah, yeah. And I have a I have a Qbert. Uh, uh, Port for the Odyssey 2. What? Yeah. Huh. That's another one of the games that I pulled out of my treasure chest, but yeah. I'm saving that for next week. How did they make <laughs> a port for that? There's like 2K in that game. I know. It's a. I. It's terrible. I. I'll. I'll. I'll tell you what. Next week I'll. I'll drag out the cartridge. Okay. Good. Yeah. So uh, the the crazy thing is, you know, we were making these arcade games, uh, and and you know, in the uh, 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. we were thinking all right you know we we're we're making the cadillacs and you know the home game systems are the toyotas you know yeah Yeah. uh so uh but of course that changed kind of did a switch in the 90s but uh you know we would keep coming out with these arcade games thinking oh there's no way they're going to make a a port of that and then they would make (laughs) a port of that somehow you know and again I, i i don't know how they did it in some cases 
uh, even as far you know late as uh, the 90s with Revolution X, where we had all these digitized graphics, and you know that was one of you know my personal points of pride because I created the digitizing system. But th we had these fantastic graphics, and then the home ports would try to do something similar, and you know they come pretty close. I yeah, I was actually pretty surprised. But... <laughs> That was what it was like to be a, a home system programmer. In the 80s. Right, right. Well, in the, in the mid '90s, Sony just gave up and started porting the actual arcade games to the PlayStation, or using PlayStation hardware in their arcade games. Yeah, that was a solution as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of fun, kind of fun stuff. Uh, this one's from uh, BleedingCool.com, or if you're just looking around the internet, you'll find out that New Wave Toys, if anybody remembers that company, uh, it started out as a company called Replicade, um, is revealing its Dragon's Lair uh, Replicade arcade cabinet. So uh, New Wave Toys has a new arcade cabinet on the way, and it's going to be a Dragon's Lair, a 116, or 116 scale, so it's pretty big. Uh, they're actually really cool because they're totally playable. They've done like uh, half a dozen of these already, including uh, Tempest and uh, Centipede and a couple others. Uh, and so here you're going to have uh, Dragon's Lair, fully playable, probably with some sort of, uh, f you know, fully emulated uh, Dexter Daphne thing under the hood to make it work. So watch out for that. And then my last news article uh, is that uh, just uh, for all those BitKit owners out there, uh, the, this weekend is the BitKit Scramble Remix Tournament, and it starts tomorrow. So check out the BitKit uh, Facebook page if you're not out on it already and like it. And uh, and and if you have a BitKit, uh, you can compete in that. And I, I think there's lots of uh, prizes, including fame and not so much fortune. So um, check it out. I actually haven't played Scramble Remix yet. I, I'm ashamed to say... I haven't even put in my Bluetooth kit, bit kit in my Pac-Man yet. Uh, so maybe I will get that done this weekend so I can play the Scramble Remix tourney. And uh, they also have Galaxian available now, which is really awesome. So I have two, two little things to add. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Somebody commented about Exterminator, the home version. And actually, I don't know if you've ever seen this, Warren. Uh, Xiao, who's a collector in Japan, has this like really crazy desktop set up for playing the original exterminator boards with authentic joysticks so i put that link in the chat um but the other thing there was some news not very positive news frober asked about it earlier and it's all coming out just so uh, people are aware of this um evo which is the fighting game championships which is more the modern gaming and console gamings uh there was a accusation against one of the organizers of evo uh for doing some very unscrupulous things back in the 90s and 2000s, and um, he has not outright admitted to everything, but has apologized to the community, been put on administrative leave, and there's a lot of kind of tumultuous things going on in the fighting game community, and there's a lot of questions as to whether that tournament, which was the largest uh, gaming tournament in the world still, or fighting game tournament in the world, I think some of the, uh, the um, like Fortnite and some of these other tournaments are actually starting to take over, um, but... 10 to 20,000 people in Vegas. Uh, there's a question about whether that will continue anymore. Um, hmm. So that is going on right now. Well, that, that's great. That's, that's sad. I, it's not positive. It was asked about in the chat. Um, it's you know, the and, negative news. It's <laughs> <Dan Reed. laughs> Informative. <laughs> but we can move right on to products, which are more inspiring and fun. Oh, all right, let's Which do that. Which is supposed to come before news anyway, so that's my jab back at you. Uh, really? Really? Okay. <laughs> well, let me move the, the cues for next week so I don't keep doing that to you. Here you go. I always felt that the true stars at Atari was engineering. Oh, you're an inventor. Yes, I am. What have you invented? A lot of things. Like? Like a lot of things. Like things that you've heard of. Like? Well, things that you will have heard of, okay? Patents are patents. Arcade gadgets with Brian. Welcome to the Arcade Gadgets. I We mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I have to bring it up again because it is just getting better and better by the day. 
Uh, F. Koth out of Tennessee is doing an FPGA cat box replacement, which is just phenomenal. But it, this is more than just a cat box replacement. So for those of you who don't know what a cat box is, it was Atari's way of uh, testing boards. So the Pat 9000 allowed you to run the boards. The cat box would be hooked up to the side of the board on the little uh, analysis port, and they would test it. So what he's done is he's got this FPGA tester that goes above and beyond. You can not only save profiles, you can actually test all of the ROMs in the board. You can run an analysis of the vector generator. And the latest thing that they are announcing is that he has been able to get it to do math box testing on Battlezone, Tempest, and Star Wars, Ooh. which is pretty impressive. And uh, Natropolis is asking, is it a cat box replacement? It's kind of like cat box on steroids. Like this is... The description of what you can do with this so you've got a screen that lets you to quote do everything that a pokey does on whatever pokey you have and then the fpga actually tests the random number generator i mean the stuff that people are coming up with is this is truly an impressive thing so what's also impressive about this is for beta testing right so cat boxes are going for seven eight hundred nine hundred bucks i mean it's crazy he's asking two hundred dollars for the beta testers. That sounds I mean, awesome. like, that's nothing. I mean, what that's... a time to be alive. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to plug into that port that's never had anything in it. It's going to be awesome. So, <laughs> I mean, I, the thing I think is really neat is seeing people use, like, so the BitKit Remix tournament, is seeing people use this new technology to really enhance, go back and look at um, kind of these old boards, the old hardware, and recreating the stuff. So it's this is pretty neat what he's doing with it. Um, you can save configurations, so you can actually run this per board, and then you can like go back and reload your configurations, which you can't do in the cat box. The one thing they're missing is the Z80 module, uh, and so he's been talking about that. So, so Warren, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, that's over on KLOV. So, Warren, all this new uh, testing equipment and stuff for, I mean, this stuff doesn't exi didn't exist when you were back at, you know, Bally Williams, Midway, Gottlieb. Gottlieb. Um, so what do you think about all this stuff now? Well, I think it's a fantastic. I mean, it, it, first of all, uh, just the, the amount that technology has progressed yeah. since the eighties is astonishing. You know, the, the fact that we walk around with a device that we hold in our hands that literally possesses all of human knowledge yeah. at our fingertips <laughs> That's kind of amazing, you know, uh, you know, n you know, way out of way beyond like Star Trek, even, you mm -hmm. know, Star Trek couldn't even envision that, you know, Star Trek. They had these big clunky boxes with a two inch CRT screen on it, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's it, it's um, it's astonishing. And then the second part of that is the fact that there are so many game collectors uh, who still have this old hardware and are, you know, they're doing all sorts of things with it, you know, combining games into multi cabinets and putting flat screens where the CRT used to go and doing all this other <laughs> stuff. So, yeah, it, it's it, it, I mean, it's phenomenal. It's, a, you know, we technologically we live in an amazing time. Yeah, I think if it I wasn't think, for all the other stuff. It'd be perfect. I, I think yeah. the, the passion that people are showing to take, I mean, an FPGA and make a board that. I, that the fact that people have the passion to make that and then go ahead and share that, I think is really neat. I mean, this is, this really is adding a level of repair to these boards that people just aren't going to be able to, to do without it. I mean, cat boxes are rare and they actually aren't that great of a test machine. I mean, it's kind of a neat thing to own, but it's, they don't do a great job of the signature analysis. They're a little clunky to use. And this thing, I mean, looking at the testing on this, it's phenomenal. They, he really has done a nice job. So hats off to uh, F. Koth. The other thing I was going to mention is not necessarily a new product, but is product related. Um, I actually, there are not a lot of new products out right now. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of stuff we've been doing. I will show just for giggles. There's the chicken shift board with all the ROMs on there. So we recreated Valley Senti uh, carts, Warren, from scratch because you can't get these ones anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but Golden Age parts. And I just thought this was kind of funny. Mr. Vancouver or Victoria, British Columbia is having a 4th of July sale on his harnesses. So I thought that was worth mentioning. <laughs> Who's having? So the north of the border guys. 
Ken Falta, Golden Age Arcade oh, yeah, Parts, yeah, yeah. Uh, who does some lovely harnesses. Mm. Oh, yeah. He's launched a few new ones on his site, but he's $20 off on all, all full harness sets from now until July 5th. He skipped Canada Day, but he's getting the fourth. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Sorry, Canada. Oh. Okay. Oh, A... Oh no! <laughs> I was trying to say something in French and it, I blew it. Oh no! Is it say <laughs> terrible? It's terrible. Oh, quel dommage! There we go. I said it. Sacre bleu! <laughs> I know. I know yeah. absolutely no French. The Quebecois would not say that. Pam, oui, pas mal. Oui, oui. That, hey, there's my a fa- my th- favorite. That... Oh, go ahead. My favorite Quebecois. Expression is set okay, meaning ah. that's okay. So that's okay. I, I, I go say sa, <laughs> I, which I think means that's that approximately, roughly. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Well, now that we've dragged the show down, <laughs> oh, I, down a few notches. Would you like to hear the uh, French that I know? Yes, oh, we, yes, we would like to hear the French je, you know. Je vous aperçu traversant la rue et je suis tombé tout de suite amoureux de toi. Ah. Voulez-vous? Well, something about I. L- it means I, I saw you... you cross the road and fell instantly in love with you. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is... oh. I've not used that, but that's what I learned. I I remember when I was in France and I needed I I ran out of uh well I'll tell you I'll say it first. Est-ce que vous avez une mini cassette? And what happened was I'd ran out of cassettes. I was like like audio vlogging. This was like in the nineties. It is terrible, though. That I can't even listen to them. But uh... hey, <laughs> what? What's our next segment? <laughs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> Wait a minute. I was, I, I, the show is getting kind of intimate. I was ready for some, you know, I don't know. Now, now it's just uh, awkward. Gay Paris. Mm. Gay, gay Paris. We <laughs> we. Oui, oui. <laughs> oh. I love it. Back in '82. I used to be able to throw a pigskin a quarter mile. Back, back to the to cave, the cave. With, with Time Runner. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Hey, folks, and welcome to the last segment prior to the interview with with Warren. So thanks for sticking it out with us here. Um, I have a actually kind of a news article that I'm going to read for my segment. Um, there was a hidden... Uh, a hidden level found inside of a Frogger game that was built for the PlayStation 1. H- did you did you hear about this, Warren? I do not know okay, about this so at all. Let me tell you by reading what's down here. <clears throat> uh, so Frogger <laughs> on the PlayStation 1 was a game that uh, many people played as a kid. Uh, you could uh, hop around from various maps for hours and hours. Uh but it turns out there's a bunch of unused and random bits and bobs hiding out of the bounds in Frogger. A lot of interesting and out-of-place things were found with the help of Frogger modder and superfan Knee Snap. Sounds like Knee Slap, but Knee Snap. These discoveries were then showcased in a recent video uh, from the popular YouTube channel Boundary Break. And this, this happened, I think, in January. Uh, one of the most interesting finds is that a totally unused level, which seems to be inspired by the video game Qbert, uh, was found. Uh, people are sort of thinking that it was a map that was used to test parts of the game, but it's uh, hidden away on the disc, and there's a picture of it, and it is definitely a Qbert, some kind of a weird Qbert level. I, I don't know if you can get the frog to jump up and down on the levels, you know, like you can do with Qbert, but... So I so I found that interesting. There's also a lot of other unseen objects uh, in the, in a sewer in the sewer level, which uh, you know I didn't play Frogger on the PlayStation One, but like there was an, a textured fridge, and then there's an unused flag. But the Qbert level has really confused a lot of people, wondering like, you know, what was what was in there, uh, like what you know. I guess when you are done publishing a game, you sort of clean up the things that you don't use. Like did. When you uh, have ever made a game, did you leave artifacts in that you just didn't end up using? Um, I, 
Honestly, I don't recall that there ever were uh, artifacts. <laughs> it's like you get you put in just exactly what you need, and then that's it. Like there was no rejected char characters like Barney the bum, you know, that you were like, oh, he doesn't look good jumping down this pyramid. Or... <laughs> not really, no, because you know, listen, memory was at a premium. You know, you 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 certainly did not waste it. So, uh, yeah, there there. At least none of the games that I worked on where there were things that just somehow randomly got left in there. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> you know. But these these are these are home games you're talking about, and and you know this I worked was, arcades, yeah. so it's a it's a slightly different animal. V yeah. Very efficient, I think, in the arcade games. Did you have to do code reviews? Like, did somebody have to look over your work, or how did that work exactly? No, not generally. Although you know, if somebody was having trouble, they might ask people to look over their code and i know that there were programmers at gottlieb where that happened but uh uh generally no if the game if the game ran and seemed to work and was bug free uh nobody really went in and looked at your technique <laughs> nice yeah. well that moves me on to the last half of my segment where i ask adam what is in What's the, in the jukebox? Jukebox? Welcome to What's in the Juke, where we pick 10 random songs, mostly from the 80s. In this case, we will be going back to, I think, July 1984, and uh, we will play a tiny snippet of the song. If you can guess the title of the song, you'll get a half point. Half point. You can guess the artist, you can also get a half point. Half point. Guess both, and a full, full point. point is awarded to you. If you don't know it, fight it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our chatters on a are on a about fifteen second. No, I think it's maybe a ten or eight second delay. So uh, once we play the snippet, we will just go by whatever the global, you know, pop out chat Again. is. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting. There's some there's some gems in here tonight. Gems, gems. I I always select these songs trying to please Adam. I, <laughs> I don't know why I also you would do will that. Pick stinkers but, out. <laughs> there, there, there are some stinkers in here, and yeah, I've replaced one song because I couldn't oh, find oh, it. Yeah. But, uh, but we'll go with this. Uh, this is your first track. Here, you, here it is. You think that's enough? Wow, that's a tough one. I want to see if somebody gets it off that one. That's. Uh, should I play the clip again? <laughs> sure. Yeah, Brian Joe says Banana Rama. Ah, uh, you have to be a big fan. Of, there we go, Brian Frober, oh, Billy Squire. God. Yep, it is Billy Squire. What song is it? I can't believe he got it from that. From snapping. Right, and by the way, we were flagged last week. We played less than five seconds of each song. We got flagged last week. Ah, uh, YouTube underlords them. or yep. whatever they are. It Casey is Rick got me tonight. The name of the song. Casey got it. So that's a half point for both those guys. Uh, that was half Billy point. Squires' "Rock Me Tonight." Wow. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I can't believe that we got flagged, and we're gonna get flagged for that song too. Uh, too much Billy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole different story. Okay, so. <laughs> By the way, Billy, uh, oh my God, we got flagged. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Billy Mitchell was our our guest last week. Warren, just in case. Yeah, I saw a picture of Warren and Billy together. Yes, I've met Billy on a number of occasions. You guys probably travel in some of the same groups. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, I and I, honestly, it's kind of funny. I I don't think I officially met him until maybe about five years ago. You know, I think we, our paths may have crossed, but we were never really introduced until maybe I, I'm, I'm thinking something around five years ago, we first met and, um, and then I've seen him at a number, number of uh, events since then. And uh, once or twice actually had quite a bit of time to spend with him and he, he you know, I, I mean, I, I, I will not comment on anything about his scores or his controversy because I, 
I'm not educated enough to say one way or another, but he's he's always been uh, very kind and uh, wonderful to me. I've always enjoyed uh, spending time with him. That was sort of the sentiment of the entire show last week. So, uh, yeah, he's, the, he's he's a good guy. So we've met him a couple times. Um, yeah, here comes your next track. <laughs> This is another like super deep cut to me. I mean, did, did, did we figure out who who got the the last track? Uh, yeah. did I skip one? Kate? No, you played it, but we didn't uh, quite. Oh yeah, it was Casey guessing. and Brian Frober. Okay. Yeah, half point for those guys. And yeah, we got scorpions all over the board already. Mister uh. Peabody is on the board, uh, and still loving you. For he got a full point if I'm reading that right. Am I reading that right? I think I am. Full point. I'm awarding the full point. It is. That makes it a lot easier for me. Still <laughs> okay, loving score, you. Keep her ready. Scorpions. Yep. Yeah, that there's a long intro to that song. Someday. That's a good song though. Okay, here comes your next track. Now I I picked the other song by the same name, Mark. Oh, I see. Different artist. Okay. Yeah. Smart. But. Yep, Casey got it. Didn't mean to turn you on by Robert Palmer. So Casey's on the on that one with uh, half point, and then followed up by Chris Peabody with a Robert Palmer. So that's a half point for both those guys. Half point. Okay, here comes your next track. This might be out of order, Mark. Whoops. Oops. I love it when songs tell you the title at in the first three seconds. Yeah. They're and it like, literally was three hey, we seconds. We don't want you to change the channel, so here's the title of the song right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just it's that's not, a throw me it's a give me one. It, it's not any Linux. It is Eurythmics. Uh that's Chris. Casey, I think, yeah. got that one. Yep. I mean, it is any Linux. It is Casey. Casey got it. Uh, and then who actually typed out who's I that girl? Joe Drosen. Okay, great. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> who's that? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Um, makes me wonder who, who. So I don't know any of these songs. It makes me wonder what I was listening to in the 1980s. You know, I was, <laughs> where what the hell was I? I don't know any of these songs. Were you a country western fan? <laughs> I was not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and we can't play too much of these because then they just block our channel. So, uh, all right, here comes your, your next track. And again, this one's going to be out of order, Mark. But Oh, I know it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to, they're going to get this one. I mean, I don't know how you couldn't. Yep. Tina Turner, Casey, got it. Metropolis uh, got the name. Metropolis got the name. Hey, Natropolis is on the board. Half point. Half point for both those fellas. You guys are doing great. Here comes your next track. What's love got to do with it? Oh, this is... This is actually one of my favorite songs of his. So good. Yeah. Album of the same name. It's a fantastic actually, album, by the way. I, I t I've, I've told my story where I was in Mardi Gras and I was walking behind this particular artist. Really? He was like, oh. Mock the Magician. Lonely. Wait, mod, mock, mock the Magic, the magic Man. man. Infatu infect infatuation. We'll give it to him. And it is Rod Stewart. He gets a full point for that. Wait a full point. Boy, oh, we should talk about the prizes and then we'll tell everybody where they're at because we're at track number six. Okay. To motivate people. <laughs> so we or detract them. There's gonna be a bunch. No one's gonna start answering. <laughs> so uh, rock me tonight. Billy Squire still loving you. Scorpions. I didn't mean to turn you on. Robert Palmer. Who's that girl? Eurythmics. What's love got to do with the Tina Turner? Infatuation by Rod Stewart. And the next track I'm gonna let you play in a minute or two. Okay. Tonight um, for the third place winner, you're gonna win an arcade radio fridge magnet made by uh, Mike Page, one of our listeners. 
Uh, thanks again for these. I have loads of stuff from him, so we're going to keep giving stuff away. But this is kind of fun. This is a fourth season logo, uh, and that is a one-of-a-kind. It'll be going out to the third-place winner. Okay, the um, the next two prizes are kind of fun. They're from my personal collection, and they're just sort of apropos for tonight. Uh, the second-place winner will take home this... Um, uh, let's see... I guess the second place winner will take home this Cubert uh, card game from 1983, Par- Parker Brothers. So, nice. game graphics licensed by, got, you know, licensed from Gottlieb and Company. So, that's kind of fun. Uh, Looking suitably used. Yeah, it has yes. got a sticker. It looks probably like a clearance sticker that was torn off at some point. Uh, because I'm sure this was just flying off the shelves in 1983. Oh, um, and then uh, the first place winner will uh, take home The Adventures of Cubert by Parker Brothers. And, and this is a, a children's book that is full of swear words. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's the I very... I love f- the way the swear words translate into something very positive and uplifting. Right. So uh, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk means uh, you are good friends. <laughs> really good friends that's that's exactly what it meant in the game when he got bonked on the head yeah that's what that's what i intended <laughs> i mean if you read this with with actual swear words it's kind of funny one sunny morning Cubert went out for an adventure he hopped along humming a merry little tune shit he said <laughs> what Cubert <laughs> always said that when he was happy <laughs> you could just make oh. up any swear word just put it in there oh i see yeah i mean there's it's the book's full of them like i don't know so here's here's my idea is that you use that book like mad libs yeah and wherever there's a curse you have somebody without knowing the context give some sort of you know really really awful phrase just a horrible <laughs> cussing swear phrase and then read the story with those choices oh. great party game yeah it'd be great i am fully confident i speak for both of us when i say that we would like to get in on this action do you mind if we join your quest damn cuber answered and i surely will need some help come along it'll be a great adventure i think that you could have a lot of fun with this book this would be the first place winner right here um so Okay, so back to the game. Where are we at with scores, Mark? Uh, well, let me see. Have we scared everybody off yet? Casey Relford <laughs> is in first place with two points, and Mock and Mr. Peabody tied for second place with one point. And Natropolis, Joe Drosen, Palmer, and Brian Frober tied for third place in a four-way tie. Wow, that's point. we got to get some points on the board here. Okay, point here, five points. All right. So the this next is where we start making them make them worth a whole lot of points. All right, so the next one's worth two. Nice. One each. <laughs> Are you wow. impressed that I actually had that in my library? I am, but you know, that's a that's a go to song. That's a great song. <laughs> that's what wakes me up every morning. <laughs> sounds like video game music i i remember like it was yesterday <laughs> it sounds like almost every song from the 1980s yes <laughs> well joe, joe drosen, drosen got it and we just need... there's no there's no stopping us now oh yeah yeah that's dude he got the it. whole thing he did he got two points he was all in joe drosen you are on the board with full point a full point times First two place Wow, that put them right up there. Yep. Okay, these next ones, uh, I mean, these next ones were hard to find. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, maybe I should just go into the middle of these or a little bit further in, just in case. I don't Why know. Why not? All right, here we go. Yeah. Well, I tried Sounds to go like the... in. <laughs> That's the middle of the song. <laughs> yeah, that was almost a minute in. I don't know. What That's enough that for somebody ring? to Shazam that stuff. That's that old school ring, you know. You know you're in an old. Uh, I can't believe that. that Casey just pulled that right out of his hat. 
Oh my god. Full Boom. point. Full point for Casey. Obscene phone caller by Rockwell. Not one of his most popular songs, but it, well, it he didn't have out. any popular songs. He was like the nephew of the head of Motown, and the only reason he got to even make a record was because of that. And the only way he ever had a hit was because Michael Jackson sang backup on it. Right. So, right. Well, who's counting, right? Michael Jackson sang backup. Okay, Casey, you're in first on, place. On that somebody's was, watching that was a two me. two-pointer. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, the, the song actually begins with, or the video begins with who's watching me playing and then ending, and then he goes into a hotel. Yeah. It's used, it's used as a segue. Very clever. I always feel like somebody's watching me is sung by Michael Jackson. Here you go. Next track. Well, these, these videos all have like intros. I got to skip to the middle. Yeah. I like this band, but they had a yeah. lot of, of, of uh, personnel changes over the year. It is Starship. Casey... You got it. Good job. It, that is Starship. It's actually Jefferson Starship, but I'll take Starship for this one. So one of my residency professors played for them for a period of time. <laughs> it is no, no way, way out. Yeah, Mr. Peabody out. Yeah, uh, I think S one S fifteen hundred got no way out. Did he? Oh, he did. I'm sorry. I just want to give all the points to Mr. Peabody for some reason, Full even though he to totally. S1500? These are all still worth two points each, right? Sure. Yep. Okay. That sounds good to me. Ever oh. since we said two points, I've been counting them. Okay. That way. Good. All right. So the next track. Later. Mark, are you on Wi-Fi? Yeah, I'm great. Okay. You're roboting. I'll, I'll check. All right. So here comes your next track. Uh, yeah. Another deep cut. Don't feel bad, Warren. I don't even know this one. I don't know any of them. So Man, I know fun. like the, <laughs> half the ones he picked this week. The next one I, I for sure don't really know. Wanted to, really wanted to win that book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll find another one for you. Yeah, it's... Uh, I think uh, I got it because Jen May ended up getting a copy of one. She finds weird stuff. She she found that ceramic uh, handmade cubert that was like a foot and a half tall. <laughs> she made like a two and a half foot tall cubert for Free Play Florida last year. Did you see that? No. It was like a fiberglass cubert that was like life size. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah, it looked fantastic. Mr. Peabody got That Sexy Girl by Glenn Fry. That's a terrible song. It is. Sexy girl. She's a very sexy girl. You know, he has a, a few good hits. That is not one of them. Yeah, he doesn't sound like he's being sincere. <laughs> she, you're, you're a very <laughs> he's trying sexy to be nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just... I'm just placating. You, you're a very sexy girl. You're very, yeah. very sexy. Now I have to leave. <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go get on this this plane and, and sing the Smuggler's Blues. Oh. <laughs> the crowd, the the now that's one of his better songs. You Belong oh, to the City. Of course. Yeah. All right. This one, man, I don't even know what's going to happen here. But it looks like. All right, here we go. If you're a metalhead, you're, you're going to know it. Okay. Yep. First minute of the song is just intro, intro to the video. Yep. You don't really know me. That's probably enough. Sure. Because if you're a fan of this band, you, you know the song. I can't even is see this? the chat right now. Brian Fober got it. Fober. Nice. Rat. Rat. I don't know who got the song. I don't know, but everybody knows Rat. Lay it down. <laughs> rat, 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 rat. Lay it down by S1500. Yeah. Ooh, whoop. Brian, check it out. A point for both those guys. 
Well, tally it up. That's all the songs for the juke tonight. Looks like uh, we hold on. I'm going backwards. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right, Joe Dross in third place. Looks like you're gonna get that arcade radio fridge magnet. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm copying and pasting. Uh, I laugh. Okay. And then <laughs> Mr. Peabody, second place. Looks like you're getting the Cubert game. Enjoy that. Don't get. Don't, you know the, they may be a little sticky. It's probably Adam's fault. And our winner, Casey Relford. He's getting our Adventures of Cubert by Parker Brothers. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well done. How about, how about this, Casey? You, 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 you yeah. did a you great could, job guessing you these could, 10 games. Casey, I will send you an arcade radio oh. fridge magnet. Uh, it's off. Uh, it'll be a, uh, this logo instead. Yeah. And uh, I'll send this to Warren. How's that? Oh, you don't Done. have it. The guy, yeah, the guy earned it. I didn't do anything. Casey, <laughs> man? I, Casey I don't know. is always he's always killing it. He he has uh, all these songs. He's like a human uh wait, what's the SoundCloud or no? Uh what's the name of the app that Shazam? remembers all the songs? Oh, no. Shazam. Yeah, he's, he's a human, human Shazam. He's a human sound hound. Okay, that too. The sound <laughs> right. Sound hey, what's hound. our next segment? Oh, we have another segment. Uh wait a minute, I didn't check the voicemail. Was I supposed to check the voicemail? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm yeah. winking at you like, yeah, there's probably a voicemail. There's a voicemail. You have a, you have a direct link and a, a if you want to go into the folder of all the voicemails, you have many options now. Yeah. I just have to yeah. wait, it's the folder of the voicemail. This sounds made up now. This sounds like somebody's making this up. I, I wasn't sure which one was easier for you, and so <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Welcome to the technical portion of the show. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, uh, this is. We can only is, make them work if they're like 40 it, years old. But is this a different uh, <laughs> format? I mean. It, it is. Somebody else sent it. Boy, all right. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, cue up the, the voicemail here because it is very important that we hear this. Uh, maybe you should fill in Warren a little bit about what's going on here. Because he so, doesn't know please. about this. Okay, so we have uh, this character. His name is Bob Zarzadek, yeah. and he's a control panel expert. So this is a recap. Pre- this is a recap. Um, while Aaron, no, I mean, uh, Adam, good. I guess, converts. I'm ready. Uh, yeah. Are you, are, are you ready already? Yeah, but I want you to you recap. Oh, anyway. So, so anyway, Bob has been in jail, but he escaped. He was at this farmer's farm for about three weeks. And then the prison warden found him, and uh, now he's working for the prison warden and writing. Uh, I think he's writing comedy for him, and, and it's not good. It's not good at all. It, uh, so, last week's no. jokes were not were nothing to <laughs> improv night. Improv night, not so great, especially yeah. when you're probably telling jokes to other comics. So, good times. And Bob, Bob is a character. He lives behind a Walmart in a storage he, well, container. He, two storage containers. They're connected. <laughs> it's a double wide. We've been on we've been on the air for 101 episodes, the second longest running arcade uh, podcast. Thanks again for the shout out, Arcade Hangouts crew, who are the first longest running arcade podcast. Yes, <laughs> we will never catch up with them. They're like 229 episodes in. Yeah, you see, you see Andy Baldwin saying that Mark is explaining Bob Zarzadek to the creator of Cubert. We live in strange times. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Bob Zarzadek. He needs a game. I think that's well. That, ah, I miss Bob trying things. We should have Bob come on the show and try things. And and, and you know, is can it be anyway? Well, here we go. He's a real person. Thank you for calling six one two five four eight game. This is Arcade Radio. Please leave your message after the tone. This is Farmer uh, Tim Farmer again. Uh, hello, Arcade Radio. I was uh, calling. To ask a question for Mr. Warren Davis, uh, I heard through the grapevine uh, back in my uh, backyard, it's told me that you may have some exterminator services uh, that I might be interested in. Um, I have a lot of uh, critters crawling around my farm, and uh, I needed to get that worked on, so I wanted to see if you could uh, help me with that. Um 
Another another question that I had that was related to the uh, video games was uh, what was your involvement with the Joust 2 arcade game? Uh, well, thank you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs> I mean, did he ask a serious question? He did. That, it's like he decided I'm not gonna I'm gonna be serious and ask about Joust 2. <laughs> he just couldn't he couldn't hold it in. Well, I, first, let me just say that, yes, he is absolutely correct. I will come over to his uh, uh, double wide and get rid of his cr critters for him. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, that is something, a uh, little side business I've been doing for years. And, uh, yes, it is absolutely. He has a hell of an hour, hourly rate, though. <laughs> uh, but uh, and to answer the other part of his question, I, uh, I was a uh, one of uh, – I think three programmers uh, on Joust 2. Originally, uh, Joust 2 was started before I came to Williams, and the original programmer, uh, I guess I'll let, just say, did not work out. Uh, he was fired mid game, and uh, then uh, John Newcomer, who is the designer and uh, did the artwork for Joust and Joust 2. Uh, you know, was left without a programmer. So I had been a recent hire and I was working on some art tools. Uh, and then myself and another programmer named uh, Christina Donofrio, who uh, I think did Bubbles, uh, was, and maybe there was another game that was released that she had done. But um, the two of us basically helped John finish Joust 2. That's that cool. Good. Love it. I own a Joust 2. Great game. Uh, it actually came out of a warehouse in Chicago, oddly. Uh, great shape. Love the game. Well, that's... Yeah, I... Careful, I'm warrior. Say yeah. again? Careful, Careful warrior. warrior. Who says that? Is that, <laughs> is that Christine? I don't know. <laughs> so I, I'm always amazed about Joust 2 because, you know, the thing is, the me it was Joust 2 was intended to be a kit. Uh, I'm sure they built dedicated ones as well, but they, they wanted they it to be able to be put into an older game. And they did research that showed them that most cabinets were vertical mounted monitors. So that was the mandate for management is that Joust 2 hmm. had to go into a vertical mounted monitor. Of course, the whole thing about Joust is you need this horizontal room, right? Right. right. So yeah. it makes almost no sense to do that on a vertical mounted monitor but that was the mandate and so that's what that's what john did he just you know and I, I, it amazes me that a lot of people love that game but and and john's i think uh response to the vertical monitor was the scrolling the vertical scrolling now the interesting thing about just too i think uh in the arcades I, my, probably wasn't a fan because i remember putting quarter in and then not really knowing why i kept turning into a pegasus um, Ugh. you know what I mean? Or like, or just, <laughs> the, just like the ramp up time was uh, to learn the new mechanics was a little too high. Like if I, I wanted just to, to be a true sequel, it shouldn't have any learning curve. So, um, I think I, I struggled with it in the arcades. I also found it very difficult. Uh, but later on in emulation, um, i came to appreciate it and I really, really love the game. Um, I, I think it's a fantastic game. And, and I don't even remember there was a, a, a couple of uh, compilation CDs put out for the PlayStation 1 that were like Midway Collection, Atari Collection, uh, and they included Joust 2 on there. Uh, and then they had interviews with like people like, they had a Williams Collection, uh, Eugene Jarvis, I think John Newcomer was in one of them too, but very crude video for the time. But still, interesting uh, interviews. If you can dig up those old discs, they had interviews that you could watch on your PlayStation. Um, hmm. So, anyway, uh, tangent, tangent, tangent. So, I guess that brings us to the... Uh, we don't have any more phone calls. I, I checked. That's a, uh, we do have a bunch of spam calls, done. but I, I don't think I can play those. Those yeah. are no fun. All right. And, oh, oh, oh. Wong. I figured it out. It's preamble and then fanfare. Oh, ah, and then good. there's probably a postamble. This is where we welcome Warren. 
one more time of this show. Thanks for coming and joining us on Arcade Radio. Warren. Having a good time yeah. hanging with you guys. So, yeah. My good. Pleasure. Now it's all about you. Uh-oh. And, I yeah. got nothing to say now. <laughs> Our shtick is over. <laughs> so I was looking at your Facebook page, and it said that you worked for Midway. I was trying to figure that out. So how'd you go from Gottlieb to Midway? Can you kind of just give us that whole? Right, right, right. So, you know, it, um, well, first really, of all, you don't work for, for Midway anymore, right? I don't work for Midway. I don't even think Midway quite exists anymore. But, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it it did for a long time. But uh, I don't believe it does anymore. Anyway, Gottlieb, uh, I left Gottlieb. I worked for a very short time out of the video game industry after Gottlieb closed their doors. Uh, but about a year and a half after Gottlieb, I was invited to come and interview for Williams. Williams Electronics, makers of Defender, Stargate, Robotron. Uh, by that time, uh, Sinistar, I believe, as well. Nice. Uh, and this was after the Laserdisc uh, craze was over. Um, well, what happened was Williams, sometime in the 1980s, I believe, uh, bought Bally Midway. So Bally which was this old pinball company. Uh, they bought Midway, which was an old, you know, coin op manufacturer. They became Bally Midway, put out a whole bunch of games as Bally Midway. Uh, and of course still making Bally pins Williams. So they divested, uh, Bally became this huge corporation. You know, they had casinos, they had health clubs. Uh, and what happens is they got rid of their video game pinball division and Williams bought that. So, Williams didn't really change. I mean, they took on some people, you know, they took on a, a subset of the people who worked for Bally Midway making games, but uh, I mean, nothing really changed. They were still Williams, but they started making games with both the Williams name, pinball games with the Williams name and the Bally name. Right. Right. Uh, and then as far as video games, uh, they started making instead of Williams, they would put Midway on their arcade games. So, it really, you know, you can call it Williams Valley Midway, but you can call it Midway. I mean, it's it's Williams. I always call it Williams. <laughs> Brian, weren't you saying that you some of the hardware that you've recently been looking through is similar between uh, uh, Smash well, we were, Brothers and yeah, Smash TV, and then uh, Revolution or sorry, uh, Terminator Two um, are the same board sets. Excellent. Yeah, it's all it's Williams. You know, yeah. it's, we had. We had a hardware engineer, a uh, designer named Mark Lafredo. And, uh, you know, by that time, it was it was one team. Whatever name they put on the cabinet, it was one team. You know, people also get confused about Gottlieb and Milestar. And again, that was literally just a name change. That was a thing where rather than buying a company, Gottlieb just decided, well, it wasn't Gottlieb, it was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola bought Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures owned Gottlieb. And Columbia Pictures said i i don't know why but they said we want this company to be called something else and uh, they decided to call it milestar so it's interesting yeah <laughs> same company just a name change that's funny there was a recent ghostbusters documentary that talks about that coke columbia acquisition uh the movies that made us or something like that <laughs> watch it anyway it's interesting yeah. to, to hear about how uh, some of those movies were made so that's cool uh and you ended up uh kind of retiring from that uh the old school uh version of those games under the midway brand is that is that what happened that was your last old school like i said for me that they're, they're, you know I, I really could care less what name they of what company name they put on it to me it was always williams okay. i just felt like it was yeah. It was Williams because because yeah. that, you know, we were in the same factory. We, you know, basically the same management, uh, uh, same, you know, people. Sure. Uh, they just bought the name. They bought the well. And again, like I said, they, they did hire on some Bally Midway um, staff. OK, so and we Brian Colon was one of those people, actually. Ah, so, yeah. Speaking of Brian Colon, Brian, he was on the show. He, Did he talk about that at all? Going from Bally Midway to, to Williams? I don't think he did. I think he was asleep at that part. No. <laughs> <laughs> he did talk about uh, White Castle. You have that yes. in common. 
We do have that in common. Tell us, um, tell us what Brian that is. Brian and I were an, inducted at different uh, in different years into the White Castle Cravers Hall of Fame. Now, how does uh, this I'm happen? Very thrilled to be part of. <laughs> Did you just get nominated by somebody? So it's actually an open competition. It's open to literally anybody. You go to their website. I think it opens up in the fall of each year. Uh, and it's a, basically an essay contest. So you write an essay as to why you think you should be in the Cravers Hall of Fame. And uh, they evaluate. I think the, my year they had over 500 uh, submissions uh, and they inducted something like nine or 10 people, something like that. <laughs> That's pretty exactly cool. Numbers, but, <laughs> you know, White, uh, White Castle is a staple here in Minneapolis too, or used to be. Mm. Um, there's a Yeah, I've been very lucky in that most of the places I've lived were White Castle markets. And there, there aren't that many White Castle markets. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I grew up in New York City, so we had it there. Uh, lived in Chicago for many years, um, had it there. Uh, my sister lives uh, in, in Ohio, but to get to her, when I would visit her, I had to drive through Indianapolis. So there would always be White Castles to stop at on the way. I, I also, in my, you know, in my um, essay, I talked a little bit about the development of Qbert. And, and what I said was, and I was very careful about how I phrased this, but I said, because there, there was a White Castle right by Gottlieb's offices, and we would go eat there for lunch quite often. Or if we were working late, we might pick up some, uh, you know, some White Castles. And uh, and I did say that it's possible that the Cubert Pyramid was inspired by taking empty White Castle boxes and just stacking them up. <laughs> uh, I didn't say it was true. I just said it was possible. And, uh, I like that. You know, it's funny. Uh, when we were gaming in the early 90s, there was a White Castle about five blocks from my house. And we used to just take our cash, pool it, and then send somebody, whoever was sober, to go pick up all of the White Castles. And bring them back. So we'd have like, you know, 10 sacks of 10 and then like just pig out on White Castle. I yeah. can't do that anymore. It hurts too much. Well, I, I'm sadly, sadly living in Los Angeles. We do not have White Castle. Um, we do have it in the grocery stores and I do occasionally buy them from the grocery stores. They're not exactly the same, but certainly it's better than being without White Castles at all. Uh, <laughs> But I love when I go back to any market that has White Castles. That's the one of the first places I'm going to go. And, and, you know, my wife and I, we went to, uh, this is a few years ago, but we went to two different retro gaming conventions. One was in Pittsburgh and one was in Dallas. And they were a week apart. So what I ended up doing was flying to Pittsburgh, going to that con, and then we drove. We took a week and drove to Dallas, stopping at various places along the way. And we passed by many White Castles, so many White Castle markets, <laughs> and we stopped. And I was just in, I was in White Castle heaven. I, I White Castle. We do have uh, a, one of the original White Castle design buildings here in Minneapolis. And it, really? it was, and yeah, it was going to get torn down. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's been designated a historical monument. And it, it is actually, the last I heard, it was an accordion repair shop. It's a antique store now, I believe. Okay. Let me see if I can I can throw. Uh, let me see if this link works in the chat. You guys can tell me, but it's White Castle number eight. Yeah, it's You're pretty right. cool. It looks like, like a, a little tiny it, castle, right, right? and it's it's down on Minnehaha. It's about a mile away. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I have to give a, a shout out of gratitude to my uh, friend Jay Blakemore. He's he's the one who turned me on to the Cravers Hall of Fame because he and his wife were inducted uh, the year before I was. Oh, cool. That's how I knew about it. And he took me as his plus one. So we got, <laughs> we got flown to um, uh, Indianapolis, because that's where the ceremony was that year. And um, and I believe we got to see one of the original white, if not the original, I can't remember, but it was one of the oldest White Castle buildings. It wasn't a White Castle anymore. It looked almost abandoned, but you could see the 
the structure of it and the the yeah. castle, the, and that that was just phenomenal. And, and they're and, tiny, you know. That yeah, and, and we were treated so well by the the people. The, the interesting thing about White Castle is it's a family run business. Uh, so the you know the the, the woman who's the CEO is like a, a f- descendant of the guy who founded the company, and a lot of relatives are involved, and they they love being part of that company as much as you know we love eating it. <laughs> it, it. It was it was so refreshing to meet these people who really truly uh, you know love what they do, and um, yeah, that was a uh, it was a fun time. One of my friends always says, "White Castle." The only burger with flavor holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's now, pretty- I, I gotta say when I when I first found out, and I think I was eating White Castle for years before I learned about the holes in the butt in the <laughs> uh, in the patties. But uh, yeah, <laughs> when I first when I first uh, found out about that, I would I, I made fun. I made fun of. Them. <laughs> nice. But uh, I gotta say, I. I still love those little little suckers. My my only joke uh, came from their introduction of the chicken ring, and I said, "Okay, that's gross. What part of the chicken is the ring? That's... <laughs> the butthole." <laughs> I did. <laughs> the The joke works. Uh, you don't. Are you, we on the air? I'm you sorry. draw the line, and then you end it, and that's why it's funny. And then you don't jump over the line. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, thank you. I will never eat chicken rings again. Although, <laughs> I, I have to say, I don't, that, that was not my thing on the menu anyways. Yeah. Well, they were introduced, like, I don't know, in the 90s or something, or 2000s. Oh, anyone else have a question before we shut this thing down? I'm just kidding. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I hope, let's get to the end and not talk at all about video games. Wow. <laughs> That'd be kind of fun. It'd be like, like, that's why people came here. So uh, I know you've been asked about a Cuber a, a million times. We, I think uh, there's a story about a bouncing ball and you're trying to, you know, figure out how to do gravity and all that sort of thing. And you've told right. these these things over and over again. Uh, the audience has heard it, so maybe in brevity, just just tell us uh, uh, what it was. Maybe more like what what was it like working at Gottlieb during that time, and and how was the how was the creative process? Like, was Jeff Lee sitting like right next to you? Uh, did you Behind kind you. of hunker down did t- and did he ever touch you or <laughs> yeah. you know, on like on the shoulder? You know, like <laughs> I, I I know you've had Jeff on your show, so yes, uh, yes we what have. did he say? about about that stuff no he said he uh, invented kidding, the whole I'm game kidding. and that you had nothing to do with it wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um so basically you know it really was an amazing uh experience i, I had no experience in the video game industry I'd, I'd been working for bell laboratories uh which is a very you know corporate uh engineering kind of environment uh and uh I, di- I didn't dislike working there, but I, I, I decided to, to leave uh, and m- I kind of decided to give up engineering and I moved into Chicago proper. I was in the suburbs at the time. I moved into Chicago proper and I basically was, uh, you know, taking improv classes at, you know, Second City. I, I wasn't, I, I really was not, I thought nice. I was done being an engineer. But uh, I would check the Sunday paper and eventually I found this ad for video game programmer and, and i just was stunned hey who's that hello oh, oh. that's my wife warren says hi hello <laughs> wow she made those me some white like, castle. like castles <laughs> yeah are, are those the real thing what, what's the other thing in the what's the brown brownie. thing oh it's a, a brownie. brownie i thought it was a bad white castle at the beginning yeah, oh. okay. well, yeah. It, you i'm know, sorry I, I interrupted you resembles a white castle is going to catch my eye <laughs> um, anyway, okay. so I answered. As the you answer. were, I, I ended up interviewing, and it was it was just an amazingly loose, unstructured kind of environment. Now, the the video department at Gottlieb at this time was pretty new. Um, you know, they've been around maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, and they had not released any in-house made games. Gottlieb had come out with a couple of uh, games licensed from Japan. So uh, the assembly lines had been rolling, but now they were shut down. And uh, Tim Skelly, who you may have heard of, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, very much a rock star at that time, 
with a whole slew of hits from uh, Cinematronics to his belt, was hired by Gottlieb before I was, and he was kind of in the uh, home stretch of finishing up Reactor when I was hired. Um, but it was a very much, I, I always call it like a think tank environment, like a lot of the program, you know, very few people had private offices. Uh, the sound designers would, you know, or sound designer, because I think Dave Field was the only one, uh, would have had an off, or maybe there was another, uh, but, you know, sound designers had private offices, but a lot of us were in a big open room, not even cubicles, just like kind of workbenches. And um, we had to share development systems. Like there literally weren't enough development systems so that everybody got their own. Uh, we were using this thing called, uh, we called it the blue box. It was an Intel development system. I think we had three of them and we probably had maybe six programmers or something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, and of course, you know, Jeff was our artist and he needed uh, a station. And so, you know, we had to share the resources at the very beginning. Um, the guys running the department were Howie Rubin, um, VP of Business Development, and Ron Waxman, who was the VP of Engineering. And they just basically let us loose. They just basically were like, look, make video games. We don't know what that means. A lot of people don't know what that means. Just whatever it <laughs> means. And they literally gave us complete and utter freedom. So what, what, I, I was a supplemental programmer for a, a guy named Tom Malinowski. He was working on a superhero game. And I was helping out, just learning the ropes, learning the hardware, wrote a few uh, supplemental routines for him. And then when that game, that game eventually got canceled, never got released. That's a whole nother story, because uh, I don't know if Jeff talked about that at all. But with the help of Doc Mac, they actually resurrected it. And I think there's one actually at the Galloping Ghost Arcade uh, right now. Yep, yep. Uh, but anyway, uh, when that was done, it was like, all right, Warren, make a game. And, you know, I, I, it's not like I had a million ideas. I literally had never worked in this industry before. Uh, I had a master's degree in electrical engineering, uh, but I was not a video game programmer. So uh, I just wanted to teach myself certain things like gravity. None of the stuff I did for Tom had gravity. So uh, uh, I just thought about gravity and, and randomness was another thing. And then, you know, I saw this... Uh, pattern that Jeff had come up with. It was basically an uh, Escher-based cube pattern, gave the illusion of three dimensions, uh, mm -hmm. isometric three dimensions on it that was filling up a screen. And uh, I saw these cubes and I thought, oh, you know, it's interesting. If a ball fell on one of these cubes, it would have one of two choices which way to bounce down. It bounce to the left, it bounce to the right, to the next level. So that's binary. And within you know, seven bounces, you can only fit so many on a screen. That means you could put the entire path of a ball in a random bite. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's cool. So, you know, I went to Tim Skelly and I asked him, uh, you know, how do I generate random numbers? He, he gave me basically his technique for generating random numbers. And like I said, it was all just a very simple programming exercise for me at the beginning. But, uh, you know, I had this, it came to a point where I had asked Jeff for art. Uh, he gave me a ball to bounce down the pyramid. I, I had sculpted the background blocks of the pyramid. Uh, so the, the, the cubes were shaped like a pyramid. Uh, and there was a ball about, and I put in the gravity and I put in the randomness and I, and I programmed this thing just as an exercise. And people thought it looked cool. Like, okay, well, what's next? All right, I guess... There should be a player character hopping around this. You know, now I got a play field. So anyway, it, it was very much of an evolutionary design. Every time I coded something, my question was, what do I do next? And then I would think about what to do next. Sometimes people would give me ideas. Sometimes I would take them. Sometimes I would not. <laughs> but I wrote every bit of code. So it was, it was completely my, my decisions about what I wanted to put in the game, what I did. <laughs> And one that's of the, how it evolved, just evolved from there. One of the common Ooh. things I hear uh, from developers at Atari, Gottlieb, um, Williams, is, uh, well, Williams is different in, in that the only real people I've talked to there are, f are from, or maybe like you uh, and Eugene Jarvis and Larry DeMar. But the freedom you guys had at the company to just explore ideas, because... 
nobody had really done this. You were pioneering all this. And I think that's something that we take for granted. You know, we Qbert is a staple, uh, you know, just like Robotron and Pac-Man and all these other games. And, um, and you just kind of, they seem simple, but this was all brand new technology and ideas and just totally creative. Uh, so you have an interesting dichotomy going on in your brain. You know, you have this engineering side, but then you clearly have the creative side that helps you solve these problems and come up with ideas. And you must, you must think about that once in a while. Well, I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm grateful that I do have both sides kind of at odds in my brain. Um, I do know people who were great programmers but not particularly great uh, at designing. Um, I, I, in my career, I've met many programmers who can't really put themselves in the place, even outside of the game world, they can't put themselves in the place of the people using their software. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, that, yep. and that makes it you know, difficult for them to write really usable code because uh, you know, they're, they're writing what's convenient for them or the way they see it from a programmer's point of view. And if you're not looking at it from a user's point of view, then you really, you know, you're not helping out a user. Right. right. Uh, so I guess, you know, from me, from my point of view, uh, I mean, I was always just trying to do something that I thought was fun. I thought if I feel like it's fun, somebody else is going to feel like it's fun. And uh, and maybe there's a game there. But I, I, I never, uh, you know, was uh, had the hubris to to say I knew what was going on or I knew something would be successful or anything like that. I didn't. Uh, I had no idea. Um, for most of my games, I really was just trying to make something that I could be proud of because if I thought it was good, then I figured, well, other people might too. Okay. So let's go through your games. You have Qbert and then what are the next, what are the ones that followed? So you after, after Gottlieb, <laughs> after Qbert, I did, um, us versus them for Gottlieb, which was oh. a laser disc game, uh, which was to me, you know, that was, that was a, an amazing experience. And one of my most fun experiences, uh, a lot of pressure. By the way, I'm, I just want to say right now, we'll do a little plug here, but everything sure. I'm telling you, you is in, in much more detail in, in my book. Uh, All right. I, I did after years of doing uh, after years of doing retro gaming shows and comic cons and doing talks, I realized I had so many stories and people seemed to be interested in them and I, I just couldn't fit it all into a talk so right, right. uh I, I i ended up writing this book and i when i started i was like all right i'm not sure where it's going to take me but uh you know i i ended up being able to fill this book with stories just just from my arcade industry days it doesn't even go <laughs> into uh the 2000s when i was in the home industry because there's more stories there um but uh so everything i'm talking about it, it, you can find in much more detail in the book if, and, if anyone is interested obviously i don't know where sure. should people where should they go for that book what's um, the best place which one gives you the biggest profit yeah <laughs> <laughs> so there are there are only two places where you can get this book uh unless unless you're buying it for me personally at a show but unfortunately there's a kibosh on that now because of this right, right. crazy virus um but uh, you can order it online if you're if you're inside the United States. Uh, there's a, a a site that is called Warren Davis Shop One Word dot Square dot Site S I T E Warren Davis Shop dot Square dot Site, and you can buy uh, either an autographed or a non autographed copy. Uh, and um, I will sign that book for you uh, if you want me to and uh and that's all taken care of there but it's only for the united states if you're outside the united states uh or you don't care about an autograph i mean you can buy a non-autograph copy there as well but uh if you uh, want to you can also buy it at a site called blurb blurb.com and just you know do a search for warren davis memoir and and it'll come up so those are the only two places you can order it <laughs> Brian Jones says he has two copies. He likes to keep one by his bed at night and then one with him at all times. <laughs> uh, I love pocket. Brian, but, but uh, you know, I don't need to know what he's doing with my book. Wow. <laughs> oh, overshare, Brian. I'm, I may, may have made that part up. 
<laughs> and Billy Seven did have a question earlier about yes. the solenoid in Cuba. Cuba. Like yes. you were talking about ideas just coming up. What? Where'd that come from? <laughs> that came from a guy named Rick Ty. He was one of our engineering techs. And and uh, at one point in the development of the game, he said, you know, what do you think? Because, you know, Cubert was at that point, Cubert was there. You could jump off the pyramid. You would fall. And he said, he said, you know, what might be cool is if we put a pinball knocker in the cabinet and you trigger it when he lands. Right. Or when yeah. he, you know, to make it sound like it hits the bomb. And I and I thought about that. And I said, well, let's try it because it sounded like a cool idea. So we put it in. And the problem was. It sounded like a knock. It sounded like somebody knocking at the door. That's what a pinball knocker sounds like. And I really didn't think that was an appropriate sound. I thought the sound should be like a thud, right? It should sound like a sack of potatoes being dropped and hit, like a body hitting the bottom of the yeah, cabinet. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we, we put on our thinking caps and we came up with this idea of using a little piece of like foam rubber, kind of like the the foam that you might stick in the end of one of those uh, tubes of uh, IC chips, right? <laughs> you know, because a little piece of foam. Nice time. So we mounted that where the pinball knocker would hit the cabinet, and it was perfect. It was the exact sound I was hoping for. And so we went to management. We said, hey, we got this fantastic feature. This is, like, amazing. You're going to love this. And they were like, okay, yeah, it's a cool feature, but – problem is the foam just getting somebody to go in and put that foam in the right place and gluing it and making sure it stays and blah 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 they <laughs> like that that is going to add labor cost to the cabinet that we think is too much so no foam <laughs> so the thing is like great feature a lot of people love that feature and my curse is that i know how much cooler it could have been. <laughs> so what no, we it, need to do is we need to create foam modifications for Cubert. Yeah, the foam, exactly. the I, foam I, kit. I recommend it. I highly recommend it. The thing is, I've been telling people this for a while, but I have not heard of anybody who's done it and gotten back to me. Um, so, yeah, but I, I, you know, I think personally that's the sound you want. It's I think Paradise Arcade Shops start offering those foam kits for Cuberts. We could, we could go. do that. <laughs> we'll need you. We'll need you to do a little QA, uh, Warren. So yeah. if you could just. Uh, and then we'll, in, in, we'll need a signature on there, Warren Davis yeah, kit. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just call it the Warren Davis kit, and then you won't get in any trouble for copyright either. Right there, you go. Problem solved. <laughs> well, listen. If I was going to get in trouble, I probably would have gotten in trouble back in 1997 when I released the uh, faster, harder, more challenging Cubert ROMs to Maine. Oh, because uh, faster, harder, more challenging. Cubert was developed right after Cubert. Uh, that's a whole uh, another kind of a long story. But, you know, we were getting reports back that people were playing for hours on one quarter. That's not what you want to hear generally. Right. Uh, and not a lot of people. Obviously, the game was still successful. The game was hugely successful. But uh, it bothered me personally that people were able to play so long because I wasn't. I was not that good of a player. Uh, <laughs> And I realized that, and, and also I, I faced tremendous uh, pressure from management and, and people uh, in the company that it was too hard. And they were always saying, make it easier, make it easier. It's too fast. It's too slow. I mean, it's yeah, it's too fast. It's too hard. So I made it slower and I made it easier. Um, and then I started to regret it. So I, I made this sort of souped up version and kind of like the director's cut, if you will, yeah. and management... Uh, put it out on test, but it was so close to Cubert being released. It was just like a two or three months after Cubert was released. So most people were not ready for it. And um, yeah, so uh, they did not release it. And and literally those ROMs sat in my Cubert at home, which is about three or four feet away from me right now. Um, and that was the only place it existed for about 15 years. And uh, then uh, I was working for Disney and uh, a friend of mine who works for Disney and was involved in the main program, you know, we were talking about it. And I was very impressed with MAME that you could just take the ROM images for Cubert and play Cubert on a PC. Uh, and uh, since it was a, just a ROM swap for faster, harder, more challenging Cubert, 
it was really a no brainer for me. Those ROMs had just been sitting around. I didn't look to make any money off of it. I just wanted that game to be available to people. And so I released uh, those ROMs and now you can, that's you pretty can cool. Faster, harder, more challenging Qbert. It's my, it's my favorite Qbert. That's great. All right. So we focus on Qbert. We, we had a little talk about Joust too. Uh, we've, we talked brief, you know, you mentioned Revolution X, uh, Terminator 2, the arcade, you know, Judgment Day. Uh, you did a little work on Cruising USA, uh, but let's focus on... I didn't, really, I didn't really work on Cruising USA, actually. Oh, okay. I, I, I did literally nothing for Cruising USA. What, uh, the reason my name is associated with it is because uh, I created the digitizing system that Williams used for virtually all of their games uh, from oh. NARC on. Okay. And Cruzen, which was Eugene Jarvis all the way, in fact, Eugene Jarvis was was separated from the rest of the video division to work on this new 3D hardware. It was the first game that used 3D hardware uh, from Williams. Huh. All of the other games, like even Terminator 2 and Revolution X, they simulated 3D, but it, they were flat 2D systems. Sure, um, sure. But the only reason that my name's associated with some of these games is because they used my digitizing system oh. to... to you know, digitize images, and they okay. used uh, they used it to do text to digitize textures in cruising. Cool. Yeah. Uh, my my buddy up the street has game. one of those. It's uh, I still love that game, and the very end is quite fun. Uh, well, actually, cruising world, uh, it's mm. got a very unique ending. So uh, let's focus a little bit on us versus them, and then we have to talk about exterminator. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I know you liked us versus them. Uh, your second game at Gottlieb. So the the laser disc probably presented some interesting challenges from a programming standpoint. Why don't you give us a little bit about first? Tell us about the game, what it is, and then uh, what you like about it. Sure, sure. Um, for those who don't know, us versus them is a laser disc game that was uh, created intending it to be a kit to go into Mach 3 cabinets. Gottlieb had a huge success with Mach 3. Uh, they were very happy with the success of Mach 3, and they figured, though, it had a lifespan, and they wanted something to go into a Mach 3 uh, when the lifespan was ending. So uh, Dennis Nordman was a game designer that was hired by Gottlieb, not a programmer, not really an artist either. He was just a game designer. That was very unusual, very rare. At Gottlieb, mostly the programmers were the designers. If you know, if you couldn't get a programmer interested in an idea, you know, you, it, it really wouldn't get done. That was just their model. And um, but Dennis came to me with the idea for a game, a laser disc game that would be a sort of a B movie science fiction theme, uh, which immediately got me excited. <laughs> and and he had this idea for uh, you know flying footage just like Mach 3, except, um, you know, m m a little bit more movie-like. And he, he also wanted to tell a story, like, with actors and have scenes, you know, with dialogue. And I was so jazzed. I mean, I'm a frustrated film. Well, not frustrated. I've actually made films in my life. But at that time, I was, I was a wannabe filmmaker. Uh, I made films when I was a, a teenager. And uh, when it came time to choose a college career, my two choices were computers or filmmaking those that those and i didn't you know it was one or the other i ended up going with computers but i always loved the idea of uh, film and making films so yeah i was I, I was on i was in he didn't have to pitch that hard to me at all uh and uh, we set about uh sort of solidifying uh, the, you know the game design and how we were actually going to go about doing it which we did but we had a ton of fun we flew all over the place uh we hired people to fly other places and shoot flying footage for us. We were actually up in a Learjet, uh, flying over California, Utah, Arizona, collecting footage. Uh, we were in a helicopter above Chicago in freezing <laughs> cold weather. Um, we were in a forest in Kalamazoo, Michigan, with a steady cam operator running through a forest for levels that became the forest level. We had a fantastic uh, time, couldn't believe uh, we were given the freedom to do this, and uh, and I'm very proud of the game. You know, it it, it um, you know you it, you play different levels at different angles. You know, originally we were talking about maybe changing angles in mid level, and I thought that'd be too distracting. Um, 
So we, we, you know, but like one level might be a side scroller, horizontal side scroller. The other level might be first person. Another level might be reverse third person or something like that. So we have a lot of different uh, viewpoints. And then we had the, what we called the interstitials, which is where in the middle of a wave, you'd cut away to something happening on the ground. You know, you got fighter jets fighting aliens in the sky. That's your, that's the player. And then you'd cut to something happening on the ground right in the middle of a level for like two seconds, you know. And, and of course, each level would start with like a 10 or 15 second scene with actors in the control room and, and they would accumulate into a story. So it was very revolutionary. Uh, we had very grand plans for it. And sadly, it came out right at the time when people realized that laser discs were not ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why like the entire laser disc game industry collapsed because people would get angry or excited. They smash on the side of a cabinet. The laser disc would skip mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. boom, game over, man. And <laughs> they'd want their money back and they'd have to get their money back. And uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, operators uh, started realizing that laser disc games were probably not ready for prime time. Well, but, and the uh, amount of use and abuse that the player took just skipping tracks all day long for, you know, weeks on end. I mean, home players were not designed to be pl played the way they are in an arcade game. Yeah, exactly. And, so. and, you know, you could put in some uh, padding or some foam or something yeah. to try to cushion the shocks, but it, it wasn't enough. So I, I uh, the laser disc craze was just that. It was a craze. And again, the games were amazing. I mean, think about Dragon's Lair. Uh, again, us versus them. The 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 flying footage just looked fantastic, and uh, you know, I posted a pic people... I, po I posted a link to the Clav page, which has screenshots, yes. uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, there's like a picnic scene with a family looking up at the sky. Uh, there's a, a traditional uh, painting. I can't remember who did that painting, uh, with the pitchfork and the wife. Oh and... yeah, the. Uh, um... And American she, Gothic. Yeah, yeah, American Gothic. She's looking away up into the sky. And then did you actually did you play any of the parts? Did they let you play be an actor? I I was uh there's a, it's really weird. I I was one of the fighter pilots. So uh the, when you cut to the fighter pilot in a green helmet said Davis on the front Davis. of the helmet. Yes. That was actually me wearing <laughs> that. That's but, awesome. But they did not use uh my voice they used another person's voice for that pilot <laughs> but my voice is the voice of a different pilot that's funny i don't, I don't remember why that was <laughs> uh but that's, that's what happened. yeah they screwed it's, it up in post <laughs> they had yeah. the clips and they messed up but i remember like i remember the auditions we actually had auditions we we had a casting director find actors and actors would come in and we'd be like all right, now pretend there's an alien invasion and you're screaming and running. You know, and these people acting in this room would do that, and you know we would have to just sit back and shake our heads and like, what is going on? How does how did this happen? This is very bizarre. I really want one of these now, very badly. I think almost would... got one. It, oh. it, 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 the other thing is, it tested number one for weeks in in whatever arcade we put it in. Really, it was really ready to be a hit. Yeah. And. Uh, and then and then this whole video game uh, or laser disc rather debacle happened and all the distributors the people who normally would buy the game uh canceled their orders wow so they uh. were actually building these machines and shipping them they were building kits they were building dedicated cabinets they were gearing up for a hit mm -hmm. and then the distributors actually canceled orders and there was a lawsuit gottlieb sued their distributors uh, it was a mess. It was just a mess. And I'm sure it helped contribute it, uh, to the actual closing down of Gottlieb, which which actually happened you know, a few months after that, I think. Do you think a lot of the manufacturers were putting all their eggs in one basket with each new game? Like they were hoping this is going to be the big one. This is going to be the big is going to be bigger than the last one. Um, I, I don't think so. You know, most of the manufacturers uh, were pinball manufacturers. And one thing pinball manufacturers were very aware of are the ups and downs of the business. So they knew you don't put all your all your eggs in one basket. Sure. You, you plan for the future. You know that for every up, there's going to be a down. It's going to something's going to fall out. The bottom's going to fall out. And I think they're pretty good at planning for that. So tell us then how Exterminator brought down the whole company. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my god well how much time do we have left <laughs> oh, okay so we're as long we're, as you want we yeah, we're, we're ready uh, to we're ready to go another hour or two but you know normally we wrap up around now but we're we're having a lot of fun so if you want to hang on with us and i know the chatters yeah, are listening up. Uh, let's still... talk exterminate. All right. Yes. So let's talk, first of all, there, this is a really uh, innovative game also. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting elements. I want to go back to something that I read uh, that you had said about Qbert, and that is while you were programming it um, and you were learning about gravity and uh, putting together a game and game mechanics, you said at the time... Uh, and uh, that you you believe that simple was better, and so you wanted it to be very easy. You wanted it to be a single joystick game. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's true. So For what Cuba, the heck happened true. where you added two joysticks with a twist motif and two buttons on them, and <laughs> multi direction? <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, that that came out of the the necessity of using a hand as your controller. Okay, using a human hand, you know. You, if you're going to have a hand as your controller, I Gotta, felt you wanted your hand to be able to do the things your hand could do. So sure. th that's literally, uh, you know, everything came from that thought. Um, let me give you a little background. So right. while I was still at Gottlieb, um, I had this idea for something that I thought would be fun. And that was to have a disembodied hand just floating, cut <laughs> off at the wrist, right? <laughs> with like <laughs> flies floating around and you would have to maneuver your hand behind a fly and hit the button, hit your button on the joystick and it would close your hand. And then you open your hand and a dead fly would just fall. <laughs> right? and yes. I, thought, I thought this could be fun. So I had Jeff Lee draw up hands, human hands. Uh, <laughs> and this again, this is on Gottlieb's 16 color hardware. So there was no background. I think it was just a blue, solid color background. Two hands, which were just mirror Im mirror images of each other, a left and a, for a left player and a right player. Two joysticks with uh, buttons on the top of each joystick. And uh, he drew up these flies. I think it was like literally one fly with all the required. So, uh, and that's it. The fly, I programmed it up. It took like no time. The flies are just kind of randomly floating around, right? <laughs> and it was, a, it was a timed game. I think you had two minutes. And so you had a player against player. And literally, that's all you did. You had to maneuver and try to catch the fly, hit the button, your hand would close. If, if it collected, if it uh, detected the collision, the, you'd open your hand, the fly would be dead. Otherwise, it would be alive or you, it, you wouldn't be in your hand, right? And this thing was tons of fun. And we, we, this wasn't, again, this was just me playing around. It's not like I, I thought this was a releasable game. It was just for us. So the, all the guys at the office, we'd take a break and we'd go and play this. And we, we, you know, people seemed to really enjoy it. I know I enjoyed it. It was just very satisfying. The, the, the flies were a little creepy looking. Jeff made them a little exaggerated and cartoonish. The <laughs> hand was about as realistic as a, as a hand could look given our hardware, uh, and it, it just was fun. So, flash forward, you know, then I, I move on with my career, uh, and I had been at Williams, uh, did Joust 2, worked on the system that became NARC, did my first uh, pass at a digit digitizing system. Uh, I was working on a game with John Newcomer. The two of us were working on a game together that was going to be called USSA. And it was a uh, sort of based on the, the old tank game, but with digitized graphics and the tanks were your enemies and your the player was driving a, a flatbed truck. It was all top down view. And John made all these amazing models and it looked photorealistic. It was just phenomenal. Uh, but it got canceled. The game got canceled and I was kind of disappointed. And, you know, it was the first time I think a game of mine got canceled. Uh, so I, you know, I was like, okay, you know, it happens. Uh, I thought it was a mistake. I didn't understand why it couldn't just wait until, because NARC was in development at the same time. And I thought, all right, well, uh, I'll find something else to work on. 
Uh, but then I was sort of assigned against my will to do a football game. Williams wanted to do a football game. And since I was now available, I was put on the football game. I not a football fan. I, I don't know much about it. Uh, it's like, I really had no interest in doing a football game. <laughs> Did they force you to watch a football game or like go to a football game or <laughs> no, they, no, they didn't force me to do it. No, not uh, at all. Uh, ah. So, but, but what did end up happening is I ended up quitting. So oh. I actually left, I left Williams and, um, right around that same time, I was contacted by Gil Pollock, who was a former VP. He was actually the VP of pinball at Gottlieb. And when Gottlieb, uh, uh, closed their doors, he bought the rights to use the name Gottlieb. He bought all of their pinball manufacturing equipment. He basically hired their entire pinball department, and he basically kept Gottlieb Pinball alive uh, under the name Premier Technologies. But their pinball machine still said Gottlieb. I think it would say a Gottlieb Pinball Machine by Premier Technologies. So uh, they kept the legacy of Gottlieb alive. And which was a wonderful thing. But after a few years of being successful at that, he decided he wanted to get back into the video game industry. So he called me and I ended up being hired as a consultant uh, to develop an entirely new video game system. And that system became Exterminator. But it was de developed from the ground up by myself and uh, two guys, former Gottlieb employees named Kanye Bomoto. You might know of him as the creator of Mad Planets. Oh, yeah. And Jun Yum, who was the hardware designer who created Gottlieb's hardware. They had formed their own company called Pixel Lab, and I went to work with them to develop a new video game system. So here it is, like late 1980s. I had just started doing digitized stuff for Williams before I quit. Uh, we decided to make a two-layer, two planes, foreground plane, background plane, both planes capable of digitized imagery 256 colors and um that's what we did that's and a that's pretty what, big pretty accomplishment big. yeah and uh we did all the system software we did all the development tools uh jeff lee came in at some point uh to help out as an artist and uh and then i had to pitch game concepts once the system was developed i had to pitch game concepts to uh premiere and uh the fly game the, the squeezing the flies was one of my pitches. I, I just remembered how much fun that was. And I thought, oh, we've got digitized graphics. This might work. <clears throat> I did not expect them to pick that. I gave them like five game proposals. And there was actually another one I really wanted to do, I think, a lot more than that. Um, but that's the one they picked. <laughs> that's the one they picked. How, how did you come up with the name Exterminator? Was that marketing or did you come up with it? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't recall. I, I kind of think it might have been. I mean, I'm not usually the one to I'm not usually one to name my games, so I can't swear to it. Um, uh, it's it's possible that it was because, you know, Terminator was kind of the sure. movie, you yep. know, was uh, had been out the first one, not the second one. Um, it sounded kind of badass, exterminator, but yet it was yeah, kind yeah. of a silly pun, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't really remember. Because, you know, the, the character in the game is a terrible exterminator, especially when I'm playing him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's terrible. Uh, like, I've never hired that guy. He can't catch risk. shit. <clears throat> it's so, really hard. Yeah. And it's so not anyway, an easy game. I, in the in the in the course of sort of fleshing out this concept, I mean, I realized I couldn't do just what we did for Gottlieb. That that was fun then, but this was years later. Games had become more sophisticated, graphics were more sophisticated, and I realized I had to do more. But then I thought, okay, we got an opportunity here. So that's where you know we thought, okay, well we need an enemy, right? And then I that's where I thought of like a bee or a wasp, and I thought of the idea of shaking your hand to to get rid of it. You know, so you can crush, you can squeeze. Then I thought, well, what else do you do with your hand? You can make a fist and stomp. So I wanted the ability to do that. Uh, and, and literally everything just sort of, and you know, the, the, the thing about the play field and all that, it was really, honestly, it was not very well thought out. Um, it, was, it was just kind of really, I, I feel like I was in a way just flailing about um, uh, and, and trying to do something that sort of had the surreality of Q-Bird. Um, 
yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't know. I don't, you know, people ask me like, what was I smoking? And, and, and the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I must have been, uh, I must have had some chemical imbalance uh, happening at that time. I, I, I actually was uh, separated from my wife in my marriage for, for that time. And I, I don't, I don't think that entered into it, but it's very possible it did. Um, but uh, Jeff, you know, Jeff, it was, and again, you know, me and Jeff collaborated as we did for Qbert. Uh, we had a different sound designer, uh, Craig Beerwaltz, who uh, had uh, done Us versus Them and was, you know, again, part of the Gottlieb family for years. So we knew him and we were comfortable with him. But uh, Dave Thiel had moved on years ago. Uh, and that but was it was a, great a, to work with Jeff again. Uh, he, he, you know, the, the graphics he came up with were phenomenal as always. You know, it's interesting. Sound, it has wonderful sound and video. Is the sound also? It was the whole platform was brand new, so that was a a new sound platform too that could do things that no other sound board could, right? Well, honestly, uh, like I don't believe I, I'm pretty sure we just used the pinball soundboard that they were it using from here. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, the, we the, didn't develop, but we didn't develop a new soundboard. The hmm. funny thing about the um, so. Pinball Resource picked up a lot of the premier Gottlieb stuff when things closed down. And you can actually buy Exterminator JAMA controller boards. And if you combine that with a Gottlieb soundboard, and I believe it's Yamaha amp, which or Yamaha sound chip, which is on some of the systems, you can create an Exterminator oh. board set. Wow. Cool. And so you know, they only built about 250 of them. Yeah. So they're very rare. So did yeah, and Ryan's got one. It's it's uh it's a at least it's a pleasure to play. Who I, I have seen I've seen them I've seen about five in the last few. I saw one at the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. Uh, I saw one at the Pinball Museum in Banning. Um, I've seen them at a couple of shows. So it is amazing to me that they're still out there. And, and I have to say, I, I, I was at the Pinball Museum in Banning, California, and I, I played it. It was the first time I'd seen one in years. And I, it was much better than I remembered. Like I, I <laughs> remember it as a failure. I remember it as a complete failure. And yet when I played it, I was like, this is kind of fun. <laughs> now, wait a second. So you designed this game. There, I mean, how do they test? Do they test market it? Did they put it out for test or? Yeah, yeah. The way that all of the manufacturers had uh, arcades that they worked with, and they would take a, a new game, put it in an arcade, uh, hopefully that nobody else would know about it, and they would just sort of gauge the reaction. We'd actually watch people play. Uh, they would measure success by the number of coins that it took in, and usually I think the deal was, you know, the the uh, arcade just keeps the money. And that was sort of the deal. And they would report their earnings over a period of weeks. So we could sort of see if there was fall off or if it was growing. Um, and, and that was a very important tool in uh, test marketing these arcade games. But uh, the problem with the, there were a couple of problems with Exterminator. One was the original board had noise problems. So it would freeze and it would freeze Ooh. often and in the middle of gameplay. And that was a really difficult thing. And then uh, Jun, our hardware designer, was like, okay, well, it was a single-sided board. And he was like, okay, I need to make it a double-sided board. And then, so he made a double-sided board, and I think there were still problems. And eventually, he really, he did solve those problems, but it took so long that I think it had a stigma by that time after having been in the arcades with this freezing problem. It, it just, it hurt the game. The mm -hmm. second problem was the joysticks. Okay, so I wanted to do all these things with your hands and I wanted to be able to, there did not exist a joystick that would let you do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to work with Hap Electronics who supplied uh, you know, buttons and joysticks to the pinball industry oh, and the yeah, video yeah. game industry. And I worked with an engineer there and basically we had to take an existing joystick that gave you, you know, the regular joystick, a thumb button, a trigger, and he added a potentiometer for the on twist. the bottom. So in addition to everything else, you could rotate. And the problem with that was they didn't put a stop on the rotation. So what happened is, you know, we'd play it on test it out and it worked great. 
But what we weren't doing is what the little kids who went to the arcade did, and they would just go in without putting a quarter in and twist the thing and twist it and twist it until the wires broke. Uh-huh. Ah. So that was another problem. Then they had to go back and re-engineer and figure out how to put a stop in so you could only rotate it so much. So uh, <laughs> it, it was literally plagued with these problems. And a- another problem was that Premiere was doing this. Uh, you know, Premiere had never made a video game, right? This was a new thing. Right. And right. when Gil came to me and proposed this, I said, listen, you've got an opportunity here. Don't reveal that you're working on a video game. Let us fix it. Let us make it right. Let us make it well. And then release it as an amazing surprise upon the world, right? So what does he do? Probably about a, a month after I get hired, we don't even have the system built yet. I read in a trade magazine, Gil Pollock says, we have started a video division and we're going to have a game next February. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Damn it, Gil! You screwed it up. Are you you had one to job. Shoot in the foot? Are you trying? You, I, you know, but you know, it, it's not the first time people in power have not listened to me. So, um, I'm not always right. I'm so not always right. I, I the game, the game's finished, and the three of you are sitting around playing it. Are you thinking to yourself, well, we worked on this. we got to put it out. Um, it's not exactly what I wanted it to do, uh, but it's playable. Uh, we're ready. Do you, I mean, how do you make that decision? Do you just say, I mean, is that how it went? Well, not really. Uh, I mean, we had a show to go to. We had a, a trade show. You know, uh, games traditionally were, were um, brought to a, a trade show and shown off. Sure. Well, Gil, again, because he made this announcement, he, uh, you know, he would have had egg on his face if he didn't have something to show. So uh, and, and it turned out I think he did have some egg on his face. The, the show was in Las Vegas uh, and the game was not ready. I mean, the game was literally freezing right and left. But um, so he didn't put it on the show floor. But he did put a big carton with a cabinet sort of sticking out the top as a tease and a big sign plastered coming soon, uh, exterminator. And then he had a few, we had like three set up in a suite, one of the hotel rooms, and he would invite people up for a private demonstration, which we would be crossing our fingers that it wouldn't freeze during a demonstration. Yeah. Um, Were you you turning them on right before they came into the room? So they had a little... I, you know, I, I, I don't know what I was, I, you know, we were uh, burning dolls in effigy and we were, you know, <laughs> doing smudging ceremonies. I, I don't know what we were doing. We were doing whatever we could. <laughs> to make That's sure funny. That, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, it, it was it was a troubled uh, development process. And uh, and like I said, it, it was it, it it was something that I always felt, uh, although even in the press, when it did get released, it got some good reviews. Uh, and it was converted to home system. So, you know, there's that. It, uh, it's just funny how these things are perceived uh, different ways, despite, you know. No, they control, the cro- I think actually a home version of it would be better with a, a multi-controller, like being able to have all the different uh, controls to move the hands properly sure, and i sure. think also that game probably depends heavily on very finely tuned uh joysticks uh and I, I mean that because you know when you're playing with 30 40 year old hardware those joysticks stiffen up they don't play quite as well buttons get you know carbon on them they don't fire when they're supposed to so maybe when i'm trying to close the hands on brian's game i'm not able to do it so what adam is saying is he's blaming his terrible playing skills on the hardware Uh, what i'm what i'm trying to do is blame it on brian because i do fine i mean and everybody else is having a blast yeah Everybody, uh, everybody, very, everybody no else is having a blast. It's very rewarding for me to hear you know, that you enjoy the game. It's that's it, good. It, it's it's a really so I I really enjoy games that take kind of a different approach on things and like the uh, the the artwork on the game. I mean, just the cabinet and this is actually a I question mean, that came up. Any like game who, with a roof. Come on. 
I mean, yeah. who who came up with that cabinet design? Well, I have to tell you that not me, not me at all. Uh, I I had no input into that cabinet. I was not a fan of the cabinet. I I do agree it looked distinctive, but uh, it wasn't my thought that it would look that way. And and I think it was mostly the colors that I objected to, not necessarily the design. But um, yeah, I mean, it is what is certainly it did make it unique. I, I, I will give that to uh, Gil and whoever did the hard design. I don't remember who did it. But uh, yeah, it's a, you know, can't complain that it made it stand apart. And, and I mean, I and I will say and actually the sound about a week ago went down in mine. So uh, Billy seven in the chat uh uh, we were getting this game ready. I would bought it from Captain's Auction. We were getting it ready for a an event here. And the two of us, I think, were up for two nights straight trying to figure out the sound because it wasn't the way it was testing versus what we were seeing on the board wasn't making sense. And we finally figured out that, like, the test we were running was on one board, not the other. It's Anyways, when we figured it out, it kind of, like, all fell into place. Um, but the sound on that cabinet really is fun to have going on in the background. I mean, it just, it's a, it's a very, there's a lot of pieces to it that just, uh, it fits together really well. So it's, a, it is, I, I have a blast with it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thank you. Be happy. <laughs> Yamaha, the Yamaha sound chip too was pretty, that's Yamaha, right? Yep. Yeah, yes. And it, it, it does a beautiful job with, with sounds like no other, no other sound at the time could compete with what Yamaha had put out, I think. Uh, allowing people to make those, you know, layered so, chords and cool, cool melodies. So, what was the other concept that you were hoping that they would pick up? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I want to give too much of it away because I, oh. I, I've not seen a game quite oh. like it. And uh, I, in the back of my no, mind, I feel like maybe someday I'll actually get to make that game. But it's, it's <laughs> uh, okay, it's Brian. Stupid. Time to start the company. Here we go. Yeah. No, that's okay. But it, yeah, it was it was uh, it was sort of like um, a side scroller multi level. So you know you 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 would play on one level, but then you'd have to go up and down uh, to another level, and uh, you were a character. It was more cartoony uh, graphics. I, you know, probably more traditional uh, genre type of game than exterminate than exterminator turned out to be. But you know, I always try to put something kind of unusual in my games i mean i i it was i never ever started a game thinking oh i just want to make you know the same thing that's been around before i i always want to do something different well the thing too is like uh if you look at us versus them uh that's really unique in, in the fact that you have actors and you're creating a storyline in a game which which then ends up happening in every game now so now yeah. uh uncharted yeah, right. Uh, is my favorite game series of all time. I just played through the one through three over the last couple of weeks, and uh, they're telling a story the whole time. It's a, it's a movie, uh, and you kind of you pioneered that with that game. A uh, Kubert, if you look at the classic lineup of games, uh, my dad used to say that he he used to ask me, "Isn't really every game just Pac Man or Defender?" Or Space Invaders? Aren't they all pretty much the same? I mean, and he had a point. Like, at the time, when Pac-Man came out, there was all these clones of Pac-Man. Because what do you do? You copy something that's successful, right? Uh, Donkey Kong uh, was sort of the first platformer. Uh, maybe maybe that's not true. But you, you get my point, that there's sort of a genre of, of games. And I think Qbert was kind of unique uh, in its game physics. And maybe that's because... Uh, you didn't have any idea what you were doing when you came in and you just like tried stuff. Yeah, that, that was absolutely true. And, and it was true of all of, you know, I tried, I started a whole bunch of different games after Qbert that never got finished. Uh, all because it was always me exploring a concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say most of my concepts involved adding a third dimension somehow, despite not having 3d hardware. I've just always loved this notion of, uh, you know, 3d world being yeah. immersed yeah. in a 3d world that's why i love vr right now i think vr is the most amazing thing um and i love what a lot of people are doing with vr uh, in terms of gaming and, and again immersive truly immersive experiences but um 
Yeah, with Qbert, it, it was really just, you know, you, you had these cubes, you had this illusion, and then it was all about supporting that illusion and making something fun. Yeah. Gosh, well, a VR a VR Qbert would be wild. Can you imagine, like, standing on a block and looking up and seeing this ball coming down? Oh, I mean, that would be... yes. Well, I have to tell you, I have experienced that because uh, I started playing so – back when uh, Oculus uh, Rift was new, uh, somebody I knew got a, their hands on a, an Oculus Rift uh, development kit. And uh, I, I had it, and I was playing around with Unity. And I'd say within about two days or a day or two – I learned enough about Unity to create a play field, hook in the Oculus Rift uh, camera, and I was I, I was seeing exactly that. I was I was able to be on a cube with the ball, ball bouncing down and look at it from all kind of angles, and it was it was blast. And run and away I, from Coily. And it... I don't own the rights to Cubert, so I can't really do anything with it. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that must be who in Sony got to pitch that to. there. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I've seen a few dev games. Like somebody did a Discs of Tron for the uh, for the Oculus, and it looks amazing. But then they kind of like stop and it drops off and it disappears. Because there's a lot of. I mean, I think to your point, a lot of larger entities own this IP, but they're not investing the money into actually generating the game. So you got these guys who are good at generating games that don't have the IP but are passionate about the game, they're making these little things that can never get released. So, well, and they yeah. do things like, you know, when they own the IP, they 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 say, hey, we have this this IP. We, we want to make money off of it. Put something out. And they don't care what it is. It could be, you know, it could be, uh, I was going to make a poorly. Anyway, it could be anything really bad, like just the worst tasting <laughs> fruit, and it could have a Qbert sticker on it, and they would sell it, uh, and and people would buy it because it said Qbert on it. But yeah, well, I'm not a marketing guy, so I I really don't know what the market is like for Qbert. Uh, you know, I, I I feel like people still remember it, which is mm -hmm. astonishing to me. But uh, you know, he is still out there in the uh, in the zeitgeist somehow. So yeah, I think there's there's definitely things I would do with the character now, um, but nobody's nobody's asked me. Oh well, we got to get somebody <laughs> ask you guys. I think Cubert we need to get Cubert onto the bit kit, and then we need to connect Warren with uh, Aaron. That'd be kind of fun. Then we could have some new new Cubert sequels. Yeah. <laughs> so so the bit kit again, getting back to this hardware, a guy created an FPGA emulation board to re to emulate 8-bit hardware from back in the day. And he has a bunch of different systems on there. So, like, if you create a PAC board, you've got PAC, Miss PAC, Piranha, like, kind of all the things that use the PAC-based hardware. And so you could theoretically put the Gottlieb board sets into this and run, like, Kroll, Qbert, like, the whole setup of of gut league games, but it would also allow if you played with the ROMs, you could then, because essentially it's like creating a virtual board and then you drop ROMs into it. It would then theoretically run new games. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, Warren, I want to thank you for being on the show uh, and sp spending all the extra time with us. Um, My pleasure. I had a good time. Yeah. And I just want to say, I really appreciate um, Exterminator, even though I hate playing it. Um, uh, and, and, Bri and Brian's always, you know, well, come on, it's got great sound and graphics and he's right. It does. I'm just terrible at it and I don't like it. So, but, uh, you know, what a, You're allowed. yeah. And we have, I would love to do another show with you and talk about all the other things we didn't talk about. Like, uh, I'd like to talk about home ports and your home and your home video game development. Um, you know, and in any other subject that you'd want to talk about on, on another show. So hopefully we can have you back. Of course. Happy to be back anytime you want. Well, we'll, we'll call you up when we need a filler. <laughs> <laughs> Last minute, you know, just, uh, you know, listen, yeah, well, uh, you... As, as long as the pandemic's going on, it's not like my dance card is full. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of counting on that. I'm glad you could make so... it. Would you well, say, thanks, Brian? guys. Great to meet you all. All right, well, why don't you stick around a little bit uh, after the outro. Uh, we'd love sure. to wrap up with you personally before we hang up on you on the phone just as a Minnesota nicety. Uh, 
Chatters, thanks for hanging with us. It's been great. Uh, and we uh, will put this episode out tomorrow. I uh, edited four episodes that are going up tonight. So, uh, on iTunes? And, oh, well, the, we'll talk about that. Yeah, they're going to be on all of the things. So um, this has been the Double R's. And I want to thank you guys for listening in. Uh, that's Arcade Radio. And uh, I hope you guys are all on your tab. Like us at Facebook at Arcade Radio. Check us out at our semi-neverly updated blog Wait a minute. at Arcade Radio. I just read it the whole no, site. I know. You you made it not a blog anymore. It's a not That's a blog. That's R-C-A-D-E-R-A-D-I-O.com. <laughs> hey, everybody. Don't call and leave comments like you usually do. <laughs> and questions on the game line, 612-548-GAME. That's 4263 in case you can't spell game. <laughs> do you like us? I mean, do you really like us? Uh, we would love for you to, if you if you do feel like it, check out our Patreon page um, and help us out um, by contributing to the show in whatever amount you feel uh, is appropriate. And, and and if you don't want to give money to us or to the Patreon, that's just fine too. We we love having you in the chat. Yeah, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's right there, like right below me. Click the notification bell so you know when we're streaming live. Nice. You can also not subscribe, or you could to our podcast on Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play Music, and forever podcast for free. All right, so that's going to be for the show from Arcade Radio. We hope you had a great time, and we'll see you on the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to turn 101. up. 101. 101. Arcade? Oh, no. That's too much <laughs> uh, I think we hey, should hang... Arcade, it's a great idea. Let's put a park and an arcade together. <laughs> arcade. Isn't that what's on your kitchen floor? I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. I feel a hang-up coming on. I'm going to ride... I'm writing the Hubert script right now. <laughs> <laughs>